the National University of Ireland Galway. The place that rewards everything you are. The university of you, for you. Your campus, where you work hard and play hard. Where you are surrounded by history and are part of a campus re-engineering for a sustainable future. Right in the heart of Galway City. Your research, where you think hard and explore hard. Where innovation is driven and purpose is discovered with world-class research facilities and strong industry partnerships. Your student life, where you laugh hard and you run hard, where your fun happens and your friendships are made. 110 societies, 50 clubs and state-of-the-art sporting facilities. Your support, you land hard and you get up again, where you can depend on us to help you along the way with career development, disability support, financial advice and access support. Your education, where you learn hard and where you explore infinite possibilities. Where your performance excels, your passions are explored and your achievements are rewarded. Where you become, with over 70 undergraduate courses and inspiring minds for 175 years. This is your future. This is NUI Galway. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Catherine Cormican, and I am the Director of Student Recruitment in the School of Engineering. I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us here today. We have a very busy session lined up for the next few hours, and I really hope that you enjoy it and ex have a very good experience. So to get things started and to move things along very, very quickly, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Indiana Olbert, who is going to host um, a panelist discussion um, based on IWISH. And IWISH is an initiative that was set up to encourage more females to join us in STEM, that's in science, engineering and math. And I hope you find this panelist discussion very, very interesting. Hello, good morning, everyone. It's been a real pleasure to be here and to moderate this panel discussion on women in STEM. So for those who don't know what STEM is, so STEM, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering and maths. So as Katrin already introduced me, my name is uh, Indy Albert and I am a lecturer in civil engineering and also I am director of project and construction management. So we assembled for you this morning, I think, a very interesting panel of engineers and computer scientists to discuss the topic of women in STEM, and in particularly in engineering and computer sciences. So we have organized this event in association with IWISH. So for those who doesn't know uh, what IWISH really is, is a, this fabulous initiative that sets to inspire, encourage, and motivate young female students to pursue careers in STEM. So this morning, uh, we will discuss how our panelists made their way into STEM, how did they arrive in their current careers, and what advice would they have for young women and men um, who are thinking about studying um, STEM subject and making their careers in STEM. So without further ado, I'm delighted and very privileged to introduce you briefly to each of our five panelists. So with us, we have today Imer Kofi. Imer is a vice president um, of technology that leads multiple technology engagements in Ireland for Fidelity Investment. And Imer has worked in a variety of roles and today she leads a very strong team of technologists to support Fidelity clients and services. So we also have with us today, Dr. Sinead Mitchell. Sinead is a lecturer in engineering at NUI Galway. She is interested in sustainability and eco innovation but also she has very strong background in healthcare manufacturing and social enterprise development. So the next uh, panel speaker today is Dr. Martin O'Halloran. 
So Martin is a senior lecturer in medical electronics at um, NUI Galway, and Martin is director of the translation translational um, medical device lab, which is the first medical device lab in Ireland embedded in a regional hospital. Also, we have with us today Fionnula Morelli. Fionnula is a biomedical engineering graduate from Ulster University in Belfast. And over the last three and a half years, Fionnula is working in Medtronic Galway as a research and development engineer. And finally, we have our own um, Avin Shidi. Avin is a PhD student in biomedical engineering at NUIG. She's our own uh, graduate, but also she had her time studying Lehigh University in the US, sometime in uh, MIT and UCC before she moved to industry. But now she's back with us, we're delighted, and she's doing her PhD in biomedical engineering. She's also a founder of Women in STEM at NUIG. So thank you all very much for joining me today for this panel discussion. I'm absolutely thrilled to have this discussion with you on women in STEM. So let me just start by asking straight away the first question. So could you tell us about your current role and how engineering would be involved? So Imer, is that OK? We'll start from you. Yeah, that's perfect, Indy. Um, so I guess, as Indy said, I'm leading a technology organisation for Fidelity Investments here in Ireland. So Fidelity has about a thousand um, engineers right now working here in Ireland, providing computer solutions and computer software for our business in the US. And in the US, we do, um, you know, we're the largest provider of retirement funds in the world. So, you know, how I started my career and how it's progressed to where I am now, I started like many of you as a graduate engineer straight out of college. I went to the US and I was in Boston for 14 years working as a software engineer. And about eight years ago, I came back to Ireland with my family and settled in Galway. And I work for Fidelity now in Galway. So my current role um, I have moved away from, I guess, the hands-on software engineering, but now I lead a team of about 150 software engineers and analysts. And I suppose my role day to day is helping them come up with solutions, helping them identify the problems that our customers are having and more, you know, guiding them to technical solutions instead of being hands-on engineering anymore. So I guess, you know, that's how engineering comes into my role day to day at the moment. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. So I suppose over time, a little bit evolved towards kind of management role. And yes. A leadership role. Yeah. So I started as a software engineer and I was a software engineer for, I'd say, about like 10, 12 years. And then I moved more into product management, program management. And now I'm more in a probably you would describe it. I hate using the term, but it's probably more a leadership position now. So, but the engineering background is 100% needed. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, I suppose, our natural progression, really, how we move from more yeah. technical to more to, um, I suppose, more um, management skill, leadership skill that we need to um, develop. Yes, yeah, and it is, it is a progression. And I do think having a strong engineering background is what gives you the basis to be able to lead technologists and engineers. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Umer. We'll come back to you later. Um, okay. At the moment, um, could we ask Sinead um, about your current role and how engineering is involved in your um, work? Hi, uh, thanks, Cindy. So at the moment, I'm a lecturer in engineering here at NUI Galway, so I'm based in the Mechanical Engineering School. So I teach engineers from first year up to adult learning. Um, and I teach them mostly about how systems work together, like operations, how you manage your strategy, project management, um, and how to do research as well. So, um, so I bring a lot of the my previous roles to this job as well. I would have worked um, as an engineer in manufacturing and healthcare manufacturing, but I've also before I joined would have worked as a consultant. Um, for around sustainability um, with, with some of the global um, global companies um, in Ireland, based in Ireland. 
So I try to get students to, while they're doing their engineering technical stuff, to also take a big picture perspective on what they do. And when they're doing, say, a design project, I like to get them to think about how they could look at the different choices they have to make it more sustainable and to give them tools to measure the environmental impact of something. So um, I get students ha to see <clears throat> how they can make things into a business as well, to think about the entrepreneurship side <clears throat> of, of what engineering is about. Um, but I also, one of the great things about working in the university is you get to do research that you're really passionate about. So I do research in sustainability and sustainable manufacturing. Um, and particularly now are more on the circular economy. Um, and so part of a national team, when we're trying to bring more of the circular economy to Ireland because we're, you know, we're not really good at that. So that's all about, you know, and engineers pay, play a huge part in that. So it's about trying to design out waste out of all the stuff we have everywhere, um, trying to make things last for as long as possible um, and using renewable energies. So that's kind of an overall of what I do now. That's brilliant, and so certainly um, sustainability and and eco innovation. That's something we need to go forward. We can't really cope, you know, considering climate change, and uh, do not really consider sustainability. So that is very very interesting. And I suppose all engineers from any branch of engineering, and any branch of engineering, really need to focus these days on sustainability. Absolutely, yeah, because engineers make those make very important decisions on how stuff is made. So um, to try to instill that in them from a very early stage yeah, is really exactly. good. And that's where we see um, in civil engineering to the big move towards sustainability mm. of energy and building of water, of changing wastewater into energy again. So huge area for research and then development Absolutely. of technologies. Yeah. Sustainability. yeah, that's brilliant. Could we then move to Martin um, and could you tell us a little bit about your role um, as an engineer and um, yeah, just to you know. Sure, sure yeah. Um, so I originally qualified as an electronic engineer. I was working on medical device development and one frustration I had was how little academic research often, in, particularly in the medical field, makes an impact on patients. So we moved our medical device lab um, across the road from the university into the hospital. So now we have a team of 47 engineers working on applied medical device development. And so we start with the patient and the physician to really understand the problem and then bring the technology all through technology development, through clinical trials and also through commercialization. So I think the thing that's exciting for me is that we can be confident that what we're doing will have you know, a real impact on, on patients. And I think underpinning all of that is is we you know we have a team of 47 engineers and that mindset is is really great uh, when they can clearly see the problem and they have years of experience developing solutions um, they can see their work having having real impact so um, it's a it's a really nice place to work. Oh absolutely I would fully agree and I think it's it's a nice really a marriage of um, different branches of engineering um, electronic engineering uh, biomedical and medicine itself. So this really where all the science comes and meet to support patients. So that's brilliant. Thank you very much for this, Martin. And can we go to Finula now? Would you tell us a little bit about your work in um, Medtronics? Of course, yeah. So um, I'm an engineer in Medtronic and I've been working here for the past three years. Um, I work in research and development um, in the structural heart department. So Really, my like day to day job involves concept development. So we're given a problem and, um, you know, we brainstorm solutions and then maybe you pick kind of your front runners and you would design them up using like um, online systems like SolidWorks and then we can get them manufactured. So we have the ability in house to um, 3D print things or we can outsource them. Um, and then that's really where you get them in and you do testing on them to find kind of your leading concept. Um, but we also do things like predictive modeling um, and this is kind of to save time building and testing. Um, so obviously we're not wasting um, a lot of product. And that's really where you can input different like materials or wall thicknesses to get um, kind of predict a certain output that you want, maybe like a tensile um, force. 
and then you select your optimal design to go forward with and this is where then you build and test um, and on a daily basis like we might be you know designing components but it also could be like test method development um, also so it's just kind of a really enjoyable and um, exciting job to have I think. Mm, absolutely and there is such a variety of project and research mm -hmm. going on and development and the really most exciting thing is that it's very applicable that's exactly what you do what you develop a product goes directly to support um medicine to support um, patients so that's yeah. that's that's exciting piece of work so thanks very much if you know of that and now i'll no go problem. to avin and to tell us a little bit about your a PhD, you've also had some time in industry. So could you tell a little bit about your, your role and yeah. how engineering is involved? Um, so yeah, uh, I started my PhD uh, October just gone. So it is developing a therapy to treat ovarian cancer and also a device that goes along with it to be able to deliver it to the target site. Um, so I suppose one of my favourite things about biomedical engineering and my current role is that it completely combines like your classical engineering, which would be say your device design. So that would be implementing the likes of fluid mechanics, um, material testing, material selection, with also I'm working on an immunotherapy. So that's using cells that are already within your immune system and like slightly altering them through different methods so that they can become more up armed against the different cancers. So it's a lot of really high tech biology kind of um, uh, uh, methods that we'd be using uh, to get the immune cells to where they need to be. Um, so yeah, I very much work at the kind of interface between the two, say biology and mechanical engineering. So that's one of the things I love most about it. It's you know, it's every day is so different. Um, you're, you can be working on in the lab, full like lab coat, working with cells one day and then the following day be in uh, 3D printing or in a fluids lab. So it's kind of, it's the variety, variety is the spice of life, as they say. So it's never, never a dull moment. Um, when I was working in industry, then I was working on a little capsule device um, so that when you swallow it it tells you if there's blood in the GI tract um, and in this or sorry in the stomach so it's to prevent unnecessary endoscopy so that was looking more at like bioelectronics kind of the computing side of it so again all biomedical engineering but like a completely different side um, yeah. so yeah so so one thing it kind of comes very transparent here clear that engineering it's every day something different it's so challenging we never get bored of what we do because we're just working on so many you know wonderful fantastic projects Absolutely, so that really brings yeah. me to my second question here we are all engineers and computer scientists but why did you choose engineering like what was how, how your interest really came about how did you know that that engineering is something for you so start email from you again um I guess maybe I came into it a roundabout way. I did business as my undergraduate because, you know, like many people here, maybe I didn't really know what I wanted to do in fifth and sixth year. So I went into business studies and in my third year, I had to pick a minor and I picked information technology. And that really started to get my interest and to see how technology and software engineering could change the world we're living in. Um, so after my undergraduate, I did a postgraduate in computing in the University of Limerick, and that's how I got into software engineering. Um, so I guess, you know, I'm not the typical, you know, straight out of, out of secondary school into an engineering degree. I came about it, you know, a roundabout way, but I'll tell you, going doing that postgrad was the best thing I did because it opened up a whole new world um, into engineering and opportunities that I never would have had before. Yeah. That's that's great. Yeah, absolutely. And Sinead, what was your um, story in terms of how, how did you get into engineering? Um, well, I suppose I 
as well didn't really know what I wanted to do that I liked sciencey stuff and I like maths um, but I also nearly did nursing because I really liked wanted to help people and stuff so I really didn't know what I wanted to do uh, so I kind of picked engineering because I thought you know it sounds quite useful and you know you could easily get a job um, which is you know it's very true um, and maybe do some good uh, somewhere um, so I suppose it was only I think I only started to really get it when I was in third year and I was on an Erasmus project in based in Copenhagen and we were working on this one big project it was actually to design a medical device for um, incontinence so um, I learned then because I had only just been spent the summer in, uh, in in working in a nursing home one of my friends her parents had nursing homes in the UK and we were working there for the summer and I really saw then how engineering can really help um, you know improve people's quality of life and also reduce waste um, if you're not using incontinence, other incontinence products um, and give people dignity. And I suppose that's when I really fell in love with engineering, just the wide variety of things that you can actually do. Brilliant. And Martin, <clears throat> what would you say? Um, what really brought you to engineering? Yes, yeah, so I fully agree with the speakers before me, probably a lot of the same reasons. Um, I think that I, to distill it down, it probably is the application of science. To me, that's what engineering is. So it's um, you know, it's taking fundamental science and then putting it to use. And as a quick example, during COVID, we were doing a lot of work in infection control in the hospital. And that to me was really interesting because we were taking all of our skills in, let's say, um, about particle flow, about disinfection, but can we turn this into a product that can really have an impact? So like I, I've a background in science so I really enjoy it but I also enjoy converting it into something which can have a benefit to society or a benefit to patients so I think that's really important. Yes so I think what really comes kind of clear here is that uh, engineering is about problem solving and it's about having really impact and helping society and, and, and that's really the core message and Fionula uh, what really brought you to engineering how did you start? Um, yeah, kind of similar to what everyone else has been saying. I mean, I in secondary school done technology and design um, and it might be slightly different, obviously, to this, the schools down here, but um, we kind of done sort of what I would do on a day to day, like we got a problem um, and you had to research it and come up with solutions. And something I really enjoyed about that was just being hands on and get into actually research your problem um, and try then obviously bring a concept um, to life that would work to solve that problem. Um, and that's just something that made me then look into engineering. And again, then I came across biomedical engineering and there I thought I had obviously a real opportunity to also help people and give back through something that I enjoy doing. Perfect. And Avian, same question for you. Yeah, so um, I actually came into contact with engineering uh, during my own transition year, so it's it's very appropriate talking today um, and absolutely loved it. Like duck to water, thought this was the best um, module I'd ever taken or quarter or class I'd ever taken, um, but I hadn't done it as far as junior cert. So I talked to my engineering teacher. It, it would have been met work as far as junior cert and then it flicks to engineering for leaving cert. And kind of was like, oh, like, I really love this subject, but like, you know, would I be able for it? Like, I've never done anything like this before. And he was like, well, you clearly have a passion for it. You know, you've done really well in maths and science the whole way along. Um, so absolutely, you know, put your head down and you'll be fine. So I went on to take it as a leave insert subject, um, did a little work placement or kind of work shadowing in an engineering company here in Galway, um, which my engineering teacher set up for me. I was like, yeah, this is the this is the career for me. Loved it. So a little bit different to the previous speakers, but yeah, I was going in strong, knew exactly what I wanted. Um, and that was, I think, the best thing about the undenominated course in NUIG is that you get to try absolutely every module or not every module but you know you get a taster of every course um that we have to offer um and i was going in strong as an energy systems engineer got to that part wasn't too fond of it was like oh i'll be fine but then i got to try the biomedical side of it which was i think the very last module and i was like oh my god this is amazing so that was me um yeah chose to do biomedical engineering then from there on and yeah, just haven't looked back since. Absolutely love my job. So yeah, 
it's great. That's, that's brilliant. That's exactly what I would like to hear. Yeah. So just very quickly, I'm very aware of time and just really wanted to. Um, if you could look back at your Korean career and just give a one small piece of advice for all these young women and men who are thinking of studying um, engineering and becoming uh, engineers in the future, what piece of, of advice would you give them? So um, perhaps Ymir or anyone? Yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess I just reiterate something you said, Indy, there when you were asking the last question. It seems like, you know, you're never bored. And I think that's the one thing about whatever type of engineering you go into. It's constantly changing. You constantly have to learn. You constantly have to adapt. So if you're looking to, you know, graduate from college and say, right, that's it, I'm done. I've done all my learning. I'm going to be an engineer and I'm going to sit pretty for the next 30 years. That's not going to be it. So go into engineering if you're ready for constantly changing, constantly learning new challenges. And like you've heard everybody here saying, you know, giving back to society because that is what you can do through engineering. You can make people's change. Like, like I feel bad listening to all of you talking about biomedical engineering and what you're doing. Whereas I say, you know, by bringing in computer systems, we do help make people's lives better. Very different to the biomedical engineering, but you still are helping people. So that's what I would say, you know, constantly learn, never be bored and give back to society. That's great. Um, many thanks for this advice, um, Emer. And Sinead, would you have any piece of advice? Hello? We can't hear you, Sinead. Or maybe Martin? Yeah. Hi, sorry. Yeah, it's just a bit delayed there. Um, I suppose just think engineering is all about technology um, and maths and physics and stuff, but it's also about people um, and it's about making the world a better place as well. So just a very quick one there for me because you're running out of time. Brilliant. Yeah, Martin, same question for you. Just to be ambitious, just to be ambitious and surround, your pe surround yourself by people who support that ambition. I think we definitely need more female engineers and even with my, in my own lab, most of our senior engineers are, are really good qualified, really well qualified, really excellent um, female engineers. And I think the more we have, the better. So really looking forward to seeing the next generation. Perfect. Thank you very much for that. And if you knew that. Um, yeah, I would kind of echo maybe what Eveen said before. If um, you know you don't think, maybe you doubt yourself. Like if you're passionate about it and enjoy STEM subjects, like just just go for it because if you work hard, like you will be able to do it. And I'd also say maybe get as much experience or ask as many engineers as you know because there's so many different things to engineering than people often think of. So you'll definitely find something that would suit you. That's great. That's great. A piece of advice and finally to Avin. Yeah so one that I would definitely give to my younger self and to, to what I've given to a few people who've asked me recently actually is to get as much experience as you can even if it's a week-long internship or the shadowing which similar to what I did it can give you great if you're like yeah I love it but even better if you're kind of like oh god I don't like that I need to move on to the next thing you know Throughout college, you have what four, three to four summers to be able to do like a week, a month, a full summer long internship throughout it. That when you come at the end of your degree, you're kind of going, Oh, I loved summer one, hated summer two and three, but love summer four. So you can kind of focus on those. Um, they're kind of like little tasters. Um, and yeah, that was, I tried to do as many of that, as much of that as I possibly could, and it has really, really helped me. Um, not waste time in a, a role I wasn't passionate about that I've been able to kind of go straight into something I've really, really loved and enjoy doing. So, yeah. Yeah, Avi and I fully agree. Just having those little uh, tasters, I mean, you know, just to really know what I do like, what I don't like, it's it's a great opportunity for us to make a good choice. So that's the reason why we are here today and why you, why the students are here today and their parents to learn what really engineering is about. Is it fun? Is it great? Is it a challenge? Or it's not for me? And that's okay too. So that really brings our panel discussion to an end. I would love to thank all of you for um, your sh for sharing your experiences with us. I've listened to this with a great interest. So um, I absolutely enjoyed it. So thank you very much to all of you. 
um, for sharing your experience and thank you very much for uh, to students and their parents and teachers and uh, uh, guidance counselors for uh, listening. So I'll hand over now to Dr. Katrin McCormack again. So thank you very much. Bye. Indeed, thank you very much for that very nice presentation. It was lovely to get everybody's insight into how the various different people um, found their way into engineering. For the next 20 minutes, I would like to speak to you a little bit about what life is like in engineering and computer science at NUI Galway. I am going to be joined by my good colleague, Dr. Noel Harrison, who, is, who he and I are going to have a little bit of a dialogue. But prior to that, I just want to introduce NUI Galway and tell you a little bit about us and what we do. Um, well, very much so, we're very proud to say that we are among the top 1% universities in the world. So therefore, if and when you join us at NUI Galway, you can be guaranteed to know that you're getting a very high quality education. And also, interestingly, specifically relating to teaching engineering, we're pretty good at our trade because we've been doing that for the last 170 years. So we've learned a lot of lessons along the road, the good, the bad and the ugly along the way, which has also very much helped us. NUI Galway, unfortunately, we all can't be there today, but it is a stunningly beautiful campus and it's a really nice place to be. And I think the longer we are out of the offices, the more we acknowledge how great a place it actually is. So this is our engineering building with our state-of-the-art facilities. You've met some of graduates from engineering, and these are some of our graduates from NUI Galway. And effectively, if you become a graduate from us, from either engineering or computer science, you join a very wide network of alumni. And these people have all ended up in, as you can see, very different careers. They work in very different spots and very different places but they all come together as part of a good network to help us in our community and also hopefully to help you as future students. If that hasn't encouraged you enough, if you, if you don't have the, to be fortunate enough to live in Galway, Galway is a stunningly beautiful place and it is a wonderful place to study. It's a wonder place, wonderful place to live. And hopefully if you do come here, you will have a very, very nice time. So as I'd like to proceed, I'd like to formally introduce my colleague, Noel. Noel Harrison works with me in the discipline of mechanical engineering. He has taught a lot at undergraduate programmes and he's done a lot of work in recent years talking to people like you, like your parents and like your teachers. Um, I'm not going to say persuading you, but encouraging you to come and join us at NUI Galway. So we have prepared a list of questions that many students feel that they would like to answer. So I'm going to invite Noel to help us answer some of these questions. So we have very, very short in time. So we're going to try to keep these conversations as brief as possible. So Noel, could I ask you in a nutshell, what do engineers do? Uh, good morning, Catherine. Um, thanks for, for having me on. Um, yeah, sure. Engineers, in a nutshell, we solve problems. Okay, We use our skills and our understanding of the science subjects and add in our um, skills and abilities for design and analysis to make, test and develop new products, new devices, hardware, software, infrastructure, networks, services like water and power, and um, all sorts of things that society needs, basically. We don't wait for things to become a problem, of course. Engineers are constantly um, designing, redesigning, and improving uh, things, products that we use every day in our lives, and doing so in ways that also improve our planet and improve um, overall um, the, uh, you know, the various uh, devices, uh, services that we need every day. That is fantastic, Noel. I think you have answered a lot of our next question, um, which builds, of course, on some of the issues that have been raised in our panel discussion. And that's the key difference, of course, between science and engineering. Would you be able to explain to us what is the core difference? And if there's a member of our audience who might be wavering between either science or engineering, why would they choose one above the other? Or what is the key difference between science and engineering? 
Yeah, it's a great question, and um, it's I can understand it because even already in my in my last answer, I mentioned some science subjects, and the reality is that engineers and scientists work together all the time, but the way we would differentiate it is that engineers take the understanding that have probably been established through our scientists. Um, our understanding of, of various phenomena and materials and so on, and we add in that design piece. And we use that then to uh, develop new technologies, new solutions and new products. A really good example of this is some of you may have watched um, last month, the middle of, of February, uh, the NASA, the rover Perseverance on uh, planet Mars. During that, just after that successful landing, they um, interviewed the uh, project lead and the project manager for the small little drone component. So as well as landing a rover, inside the rover there's a small little drone, I think they call it a helicopter ingenuity. Um, and they asked uh, the uh, lead for that, whose name was Mi Miang, um, what are they going to do? Uh, what science are you going to do on Mars? And she turned around and said, we're not doing science, we're doing engineering. We have studied what the planet is like, we have designed and optimized a brand new drone device to fly on a planet remotely, autonomously, with uh, you know super weight, super lightweight materials, um, very smart controls, and um, that's what we're doing. We are we've we are engineers, and we're we've engineered this brand new device to fly on a planet. The science piece is happening. The scientists are working with the um, instruments that are on the rover but we're engineers. And that's kind of a good example of how engineers and scientists work together, but there's, they have different skills and different roles and different functions in whatever the project is. That's very interesting, Noel, because I think Professor Martin O'Halloran also introduced something similar when he said, it's about the application, it's about doing something as well too. And Sinead Mitchell also brought that up in her talk earlier on. So when it comes to learning and engineering, we also learn by doing. So we're in very engaged in the facilities around us, the technology that we use, and we have some wonderful stories to tell in this regard. And I certainly know that some of our speakers later on are going to talk to you in a little bit more detail about some of those exciting projects, such as our energy efficient um, Formula One racing car, and also some of the other um, projects that we work on. But my next question really is, I, I certainly understand, and definitely from having spoken to people in schools, but there seems to be a misunderstanding sometimes or an uncertainty regarding the various different disciplines that are involved in engineering. And some of our people, especially Aideen this morning, she advocated moving towards undenominated engineering. But for those of us who don't really understand the difference between some of these disciplines, would you be able to just help us understand them in a little bit more detail, Noel? Yeah, sure. I can, I can give a little bit of guidance, but what I would say is I probably can't do justice to all the disciplines of engineering. So I'd encourage everyone to, to stay tuned uh, for the rest of the morning. You'll hear dedicated talks from all our different disciplines of engineering that will give you a better insight. Um, there's a lot of commonality, but what I would say is we differ across engineering disciplines. We differ in terms of maybe the size scale that we're operating, that we're designing and manufacturing at. We are um, differ in terms of the materials that we might be working with. We be differing in terms of are we designing things that move or things that don't move? And we don't, we're not saying how fast things move or how slow things move. We um, differ in terms of you know how much uh, maybe hardware and software and control and electronics we might be involved in what we are working with and designing, and we we differ in terms of the environments that we might be designing and manufacturing parts from. That might be a, an underwater tidal turbine device. It might be concrete um, structures for, for foundations for large buildings and infrastructure. Um, it could be medical devices, hip implants, uh, cardiovascular stents for, for the human body. Um, it depends on those. So uh, the, the differences is really the application, where we apply our skills. There's a lot of commonality. And as, as you mentioned, we do have the undenominated first year uh, modules and through our first year um, program. Uh, and through maybe the earlier years, first year and second year, there is a fair bit of uh, commonality and overlap. But as the students uh, go through their uh, four and five years, they'll uh, uh, focus on more specialist subjects that are a little bit more um, uh, dedicated to their field. So I'd say tune in to the talks that are coming up in the next, um, the next couple of hours for, for more details and insights from our colleagues in those various disciplines. 
thanks very much, Noel. And certainly we're going to get a taste about what our civil engineers do. And many of them focus on large infrastructure and construction projects. We're going to look a little bit more about the electrical and electronic engineering, where you're talking about um, computing devices, maybe software systems and power systems, L learning a little bit more about mechanical engineering. This is a discipline that both Noel and I work in at the moment. And mechanical engineering focuses very much on engineering that moves, whether it's large or small. It could be there in the area of transport, medical devices, power generation, or indeed manufacturing automation and robotics. And, and finally, like our colleague um, Avian at the moment, who's studying biomedical engineering and described it with such passion and force, how wonderful it is and how diverse, of course, it can be looking at living tissues and how engineers relate to that. And of course, Martin as well runs a very, very large lab dealing with, with all sorts of problems that they try to address. Um, and finally, and of course, very, very importantly, is the whole area of energy systems engineering. It's gaining much traction and definitely much interest as well, too, from our students. It's becoming very, very prominent as we strive very hard to become more sustainable. And certainly Sinead Mitchell discussed a little bit about the importance of that as well, too, in her role earlier on today. And we'll certainly be hearing more about that later on. But now, effectively, what we'd like to do is just ask ourselves, well, is this for you? Is this something that you might consider using? And of course, how might you know if you think you'd like to be a good engineer? There, there are many myths perhaps surrounding the area of engineering, and um, perhaps there's elements of ambiguity. So, so the question I'm going to ask now, Noel, is how do people know whether or not engineering is for them? Yeah, uh, again, great question that, that many of you are probably asking yourselves. I would say number one is to have an interest in things, to have an interest in how things work, uh, an, in, an interest maybe in how things are made or why they're designed a certain way, or an interest in in, in, in improving things. Uh, maybe, you know, thinking, can things be done better? Everything else in terms of your skills, don't forget, we teach that, okay? So we when students come to us, um, they're coming out of various, uh, sec usually secondary schools from all around Ireland and some from outside of Ireland. And, you know, so uh, there's there's a, a huge spread of uh, experience and ability uh, before you come here. But in first year and from first year, second year upwards, we bring the students up to the required level that they need in the various subjects. Um, one of the questions that we do get asked a lot is, do, do I need to be great at maths? And I say, no, you don't need to be great at maths. And again, for the same reason, everybody's experience is different. We teach maths and our colleagues in the maths departments teach maths for our first years as well and, and in second year. So we bring everyone up to the same level. It helps if you don't hate maths, OK, but because uh, maths is part of a lot of what engineers do in terms of design and analysis and so on. Um, but everything else is um, a I think I think an interest is the best way to describe it. Um, and uh, you know everything else in terms of uh, the skills that you need we, we teach here okay we, we don't we, you're not an engineer before you come here but if you have an interest we will um we will teach everything else that you need thank you noel i think that's very very insightful and i suppose just a few words briefly then on the entry requirements i know most people here are in transition year and you're deciding on what subjects that you want to take and of course you're deciding on what level of effort that you need to put in for the next few years prior to your leaving third but can you talk a little bit about the entry requirements, Noel, for, for engineering at, at NUI Galway in particular? Sure, yeah. Well, anyone who, who looks at the CEO points will notice that there is a bit of fluctuation every year for each of the programmes. Um, but what is fairly consistent are, are the other requirements, which are the H5 requirement in two subjects and um, passes in four other subjects, basically, one of them being a science subject. Um, students must have a either a, a H4 in Leaving Cert Maths, but if you don't have that uh, grade in Maths, but you do have the points, you can still um, gain access to our courses by sitting a special entrance Maths exam. And that's an exam that in a normal year, um, uh, comes at the end of a, a short kind of a one week course where uh, which normally happens in that week between when the leaving cert results will come out and the CEO course offers uh, are made. So um, if you fall into that category where you have the points but not the maths grade then um, there's still an option to do that and there's information of that on our school uh, websites or on individual discipline websites as well. Noel, thanks very much for that. Um, I've just one or two very short questions to finish up with at the end, because I know we don't have much time left. But I think a burning question that a lot of people 
um, ask and, and definitely was highlighted by as well, the importance of it, of course, was highlighted by Evie earlier on when she talked about the importance of work experience. Um, does everybody do work experience in engineering? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And work experience, I think it's one of the best parts of our engineering programs here. And um, so what happens is students on the five year program uh, will spend their second half of fourth year and that summer between fourth year and, and fifth year out in, out in industry, working alongside engineers as a uh, intern engineer or a junior engineer and get an opportunity to put into practice skills that they have learned uh, in the previous couple of years and also get a better context for what an engineer does in industry. We do that really well in Galway. We resource it really well. We've dedicated offices where we have staff that work with the students a year before this happens, work with them in terms of preparing their CV, holding mock interviews with real companies so that students are prepped and have all those skills needed to, to uh, enter the workforce and, and to do that early. The other final quick thing I'd say is there's huge demand for our students at that stage from industry across all the sectors where they want um, our students to join their workforce. It's uh, for in most cases it's for eight months, but it does differ slightly for certain programs. Um, and uh, that's reflected then on the demand for our students when they finish, when they graduate from the university, where they're snapped up in industry very, very quickly. So it's a big part of our program. And we notice a change in students when they come back from industry. They're that bit more professional, you know, they bring a little bit more of maturity and professional um, uh, mindset to their work and they're, they're a different type of student when they come back. So it's really it's really good part of our, our uh, programs. And as I said, we do that really well in Galway. In other universities, it's optional or it's not resourced as well, but um, it's, it's big here in any way, Galway. And of course, that's where our network comes into play as well too, where you see people like Emer from Fidelity Investments, when you see people like from Medtronic, from Boston Scientific, from all of these companies who come to work with us, they, they come to give back because they want to see you coming back into their companies, not only for work experience, but to stay and work afterwards. So all of our programs, by the way, are accredited by Engineers Ireland. So the voice of industry is very, very important. And Engineers Ireland help us at NUI Galway understand what are the requirements of industry. And we can see those requirements back in to our programs and facilities so that you get the very best experience possible. So there's very one last question that I'm going to ask Noel, and I'm, it's unfortunate that I, we actually can't give you a guided tour, but that's regarding the facilities. Noel, in a few words, how would you sum up the facilities at NUI Galway? Uh, world class really is what they are. Um, we have a dedicated uh, standalone building. You've shown a few pictures of them there, Catherine. It's a 14,000 square meter building uh, dedicated for engineering students. So we have the big lecture theatres like you see there. We have smaller classrooms as well for the smaller uh, classes uh, that happen later in the programme. We've dedicated labs. A mat with the building is packed with uh, packed with spacious labs, if, if that's not too much of a, a contradiction, um, which are dedicated to individual subject matters, like uh, labs specifically for thermodynamics, specifically for materials, specifically for concrete, specifically for timber, specifically for fluids. And that was one of the big highlights that Engineers Ireland reported back about what they liked about what we do in engineering in, at NUI Galway. The facilities and the practical side of the uh, programs that we run are really fantastic uh, and the time and the opportunity that our students get to get some hands-on experience and um, you know it's not all lecture lecture hall or classroom activity we get students into the lab for experiments for project work for building and so on again no. such a shame we're not there Noel, thank you so much for your, all of your help today I think by answering these questions while I'm very certain we haven't answered everything I'm quite confident that we, we have covered a lot of material in a very, very short time to try to give an insight and a better understanding of what life is like at NUI Galway. And we would certainly encourage everybody that's here today to consider us as an option. And of course, to follow up with us afterwards as well too. And we'll speak more about that later on. But Noel, I'd like to thank you very much for your help today. And also as well too, I am honoured and delighted to be able to introduce my colleague, Nathan Quinlan. Nathan also works in the discipline of mechanical engineering at NUI Galway. He is our head of discipline and he manages us and looks after us very well. So Nathan is going to give us a talk about 
a, a sampler, a taster about some of the things that we can expect perhaps as a student in mechanical engineering at NUI Galway. So Nathan, I'm going to hand it directly over to you. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Noel. And thanks to all the panellists earlier. It's been really interesting. I think I might I might give this engineering thing a go. It looks, it looks good. Uh, so this is going to be the first of your, uh, and thanks to all of you who are listening out there. I can't see you, but uh, thanks a lot for giving us your time and, uh, and joining us uh, today. Um, this is the first of your, your mini lectures uh, for the day. You know, we're trying to kind of give you a, a, an experience of what, what you experience as an engineering student, I guess, uh, uh, when you when you join us as a, as a, as a full time student. Um, several of your mini lectures are going to be about the geek, the Galway energy efficient car. And I'm just happen to be the first in the running order here. So I will explain what that is. Uh, first of all, uh, the geek is a car, as the name suggests. Uh, it's built by engineering students in NUI Galway, and uh, I'll let this video run. How to improve it in that. To give you an idea. Down into teams who deal with the aerodynamic aspects of the car, the mechanical aspects, the electrical aspects, and the electronic and sensor aspects um, that we would be encountering during a competitive race. And that was a really eye-opening experience for us, and uh, the car performed extremely well. So the event that you see there, the race that you see is called Shell Eco Marathon Europe, and it's a race where the winner uh, is not the car that goes the fastest, it's the car that uses the smallest amount of energy. So we started on this in October 2013. It seemed like a, a harebrained scheme, uh, but with my colleagues Rory and uh, Maeve and later Martin, we said we'd give it a go and get a team of students together uh, and you know see what's the worst that could happen. So students just took hold of this uh, and did an amazing job on it. Uh, a year and a half later, they were racing in Rotterdam at this uh, this Europe-wide event, uh, and they came 23rd out of 51 competitors in the uh, in the battery electric uh, class. So, you know, on the first attempt, on the first outing here, first ever Irish team to compete in this thing, uh, they were in the top half of the competition. Uh, the score there, this number, 287 kilometers per kilowatt hour, that's a measure of how much energy the car is using to travel a kilometer. Uh, the more familiar way to measure that is miles per gallon. Okay, so this car performed at the equivalent of about eight thousand miles per gallon. Um, have you know? Do you know what, what what the number is for your for for an ordinary car? Uh, most cars on the road are doing thirty to forty miles per gallon. The very best cars driving around the road are the electric cars. Uh, they're doing the equivalent of about 100 miles per gallon. So this car was 80 to 100 to 200 times more efficient than anything else on the road. OK, that's what that's what we're talking about here. And this is built by by students, by people who are just two or three or four years ahead of you uh, in their education and their career. So, we, we you know, we kind of went to Rotterdam with a bit of trepidation, wondering, uh, you know, could we really do this? Could we pull this off? We came home from Rotterdam and the students came home from Rotterdam fired up and ready to, to go to the next level. So uh, in one year following that, they built a completely new car, designed it on paper, designed it on the computer, started to put it together, started to test it, uh, built this new uh, body shape, uh, really hard work. Some of it is, you know, it's about putting in the hours. It's also about brain power. And they rolled out this completely new car, an absolutely beautiful uh, looking car. Um, Hard, you know, hard work and knowledge, and this is the new car racing in London. Just on the left there, you can see London Olympic Stadium, and this is one of our drivers at work. So, um, you know, it is racing, it's low speed racing, but it's the results. Three, five, four, yes! Yeah! 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 Uh, I can't watch this without getting emotional, right? This is the result here. This was uh, score went up from 287 to 354 on a much tougher course uh, and up to 13th position, you know. So students from NUIG are now uh, 13th in Europe at what they do. Europe is by far the hardest and toughest competition of the three rounds of this competition that happened around the world. Uh, so, you know, the score put, put, put us something like 17th or 18th worldwide, okay? Uh, so, you know, world class engineering from engineers who are still students, they're only getting started uh, and it's uh, um, it exceeded my uh, my wildest expectations really, my wildest hopes and it just 
somebody talked earlier on about being ambitious, you know, and this is, I learned a lesson here. I've got a lot of gray here, here but I'm still learning. Uh, the lesson here is to be ambitious uh, and to aim high. So that's what the geek is and what it's about. Uh, you're going to have three uh, mini mini lectures on the uh, on the engineering behind the geek. OK, um, you'll have uh, a session with Dr. Maeve Duffy and Professor Martin Glavin on the electronic and electrical aspects. Uh, Dr. Rory Monaghan on the uh, energy management and how it relates to energy systems engineering. Uh, and myself on the mechanical engineering side, I'll talk about the aerodynamics, which is just one element of mechanical engineering in the car. It's a real, it's a multidisciplinary project where these multiple strands of engineering uh, uh, come together. So, you know, the subject uh, aerodynamics, when we talk about cars, uh, the, the, the aerodynamics really is the question. Why does the air slow you down and drag you back? Uh, and what can you do about that? OK, um, there are two reasons that air uh, slows you down. Uh, one uh, is that air is heavy. It has mass. Most of the time we don't notice it, but it does actually have mass. And the faster you go, the more you experience that mass. So if you're going fast on a bike, you feel it. You feel it as wind and you feel it pushing you back. Uh, it's very clear in this picture. This car is the current um, land speed record holder. And as it's going across the desert here, you can see this kind of line where there's a change in color in the sand because the sand has been disturbed there and it's been disturbed by uh, the shock wave produced by the car because the car is actually moving faster than sound in this picture. And there's a shock wave there that's kicking up dust. Uh, and that shock wave is kind of there because the car has to get the, it has to push the air out of its way, okay? Uh, and because the car is supersonic, it, it just looks particularly uh, dramatic. So that's one reason why uh, air slows you down. The other reason is that air is sticky. Uh, and again, we don't notice this most of the time, but you notice it with honey or with uh, with olive oil. You notice that it is a bit sticky. It sticks to things and uh, liquids and gases do the same. Even air does it to a lesser extent. But it still does the same thing. It's just a smaller uh, number. And these are the two things that we have to we have to understand to design the car uh, in order to absolutely minimize the force that it needs to, to move through the air because that, that's wasted energy. OK, we're, we're designing a car to use minimum energy. And if we're just moving air around uh, because the air is heavy and because the air is sticky, then that's uh, so I'm going to focus more mostly on the first of those two things, okay, the, the mass of the air. And here are two examples of other engineered, designed products and systems where aerodynamics matter, footballs um, and uh, wind turbines. And aerodynamics and fluid dynamics is everywhere when you start to, when you start kind of thinking about it, you notice it everywhere. Uh, so this is the equation uh, that tells us how much force we need to move an object through air or through any liquid or gas. That D is a force there, that's the drag force, okay? So the bigger that is, the more the air is pushing us back and the harder we have to work to move forward through the air. Um, that CD there is the drag coefficient and that is the property of a shape. It's not a property of the size, it's a property of shape. So a sphere has a different drag coefficient than uh, a wing, say, okay? Uh, that that curly uh, letter P there is the Greek letter rho. That's the density of the air or the fluid. So, you know, for water, that number is about a thousand. For air, that number is only about one. Uh, v squared is the speed squared, the speed multiplied by the speed. So that's a very punishing uh, uh, part of the equation because if you double the speed, you don't double the force. You get four times the force. If you triple the speed, you get nine times the force. Okay, so that's a that's a real uh, that that's a really hard uh, part of the equation there. And a is basically a number that characterizes the size of the object. You know, the bigger the car, the more force it's going to take to uh, to push through the air. Okay, so that's what we're trying to minimize. And the one that we work on the most, there are some things we can't do anything about. We can't do anything about the density of the air. We can't design air of a lower density because the air is the air. Uh, we don't have much choice about the speed because in the uh, competition that the Geek races in, uh, you have to maintain 25 kilometers per hour uh, minimum. You're not allowed to just crawl around. 
So we can't do anything about that. But we can do things about by engineering and by design. We can do things about the drag coefficient, which is the shape and the frontal area, which is the size. So we make a, a car that is uh, that has good shape and is uh, slender. So just take 30 seconds here to think about shape. Here's three different shapes. And I just want you to think about try and put them in order. Which one do you think has the lowest drag coefficient, which is the second lowest, uh, and which is the uh, which is the worst? Just think about that for a few seconds. Nathan, you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. OK. Um, uh, your your the teardrop is, is the best shape. OK, uh, your basic brick has a drag coefficient of two. If you round off the nose of the brick a bit, you get a drag coefficient of 1.1. But if you streamline the back of the brick, you get a drag coefficient of 0 0.15. So the surprising thing here uh, that was surprising to me when I learned it first was that the back is actually more important than the front in aerodynamics. OK. Uh, everywhere, if you're kind of tuned into thinking about it, the cross section of wings and airplanes, racing bike helmets, airliners, they all have this roundish front uh, and a pointy back. Uh, and that's the shape. That's kind of that was kind of the evolution of the second generation uh, geek. So this uh, shape here which is a shape where you try and get everything inside the car, the wheels and everything, bring them inside the car, you get a drag of 2.3 newtons. Uh, if you take a, a different approach where you make the car as skinny as possible, just, you know, just, just a tube really that the driver can just about fit into lying down. Uh, and you, you have to have the wheels out wide for stability, but if you put them out wide and you, um, you, you try to clean them up a bit, you try to cover them in these fairings, you get a drag it is actually worse 3.1 newtons so all the work i'm showing you here was done by a student uh, that is a car um, that was designed along the same lines not 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 an nyg car but uh, that basic idea uh, and this student tried a whole sort of range of these shapes in between shapes and hybrid shapes uh, and the kind of surprising conclusion from this was that nothing does better than this, this kind of a shape here where you bring the wheels and everything inside the car, which means making the car a bit wider and a bit of a fuller shape. But uh, by enclosing everything, you get this super clean uh, streamlined shape. And that's the car that was built. That was the convergence of that design. So that's a real example of a design process um, where you kind of iterate, you, you know, you, you, you get to bring in some understanding from the scientific side, some knowledge, a lot of computer modeling and a lot of hard work then to build the thing. And that's that's a sort of typical template uh, of engineering design and what engineers do. Uh, I'm running a bit short on time, so there's lots of lovely stuff I wanted to show you, which I'm not going to show you. I am going to show you this picture, which uh, which I love, which is the NUI Galway team receiving the technical innovation prize at the 2018 Shelley Cup Marathon. Uh, didn't win the race, not not the most efficient car there, but won the prize for the best single bit of engineering in the whole competition across 200 teams from all around Europe, including the most famous uh, engineering schools in Europe. NUI Galway, a bunch of 18 to 22 year olds from the west of Ireland mostly are up there as good as any of those. You know, that's uh, that inspires me and gets me going to work uh, every day. Um, just to look back at the very first team, uh, where are they now sort of thing seven or eight years on? Um, Barry, you saw already, runs his own company. He has invented uh, some new technology for electric vehicle batteries. Uh, Paul Mannion is the guy who did all the aerodynamics. He is unarguably the world expert on the aerodynamics of cycling for Paralympic athletes. Uh, Sorsha works at Ford, as in Ford cars, on their electric car systems, electric motors. Uh, Dan here works, on, um, works at Oxford University and Rolls-Royce on jet engines. Rolls-Royce has a small business making fancy cars. They have a very big business making jet engines and so on. People, you know, working at companies you've heard of doing world class stuff uh, all over the place. Mary Rose, the driver, uh, uh, designed medical devices for a while. She now writes uh, engineering software. OK, so again, ambition, you know, you do an engineering degree, you can uh, you can go anywhere. 
that's the end of my bit about the geek. Uh, a few minutes now on uh, mechanical engineering. Um, I see Catherine's coming on, which probably means my time is nearly up. Um, mechanical engineers, in a nutshell, design stuff that moves, roughly speaking. Okay, if it moves, it's mechanical engineering. There are obvious things like cars and airplanes, the mechanical engineering, mechanical engineers uh, design. Um, there are less obvious stuff like, you know, looking at microscopic scales here at what exactly happens in a piece of metal when it breaks or when you weld it up uh, to make something. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here to mention the placement uh, program uh, again, uh, which is, as Noel was uh, mentioning, it is, I believe, it's the best student placement program in Ireland. These are some of the employers. Uh, and these are also the companies that employ graduates and give them uh, careers. And the interesting thing about mechanical engineers is that they're in every industry, really. So yes, the obvious stuff like aerospace and cars and power stations, but also, you know, medical devices. When the medical device industry is doing well, mechanical engineers are hired because medical devices are basically pieces of metal and plastic. Uh, when the computer industry is doing well, Intel hires mechanical engineers because they have machines that etch out these microscopic transistors, and that's a process that involves heat and movement. It's mechanical engineering stuff. Um, and whatever the product is, everything that is made is made with machines that are designed by mechanical engineers. So I would say mechanical engineering is very kind of stable in its employment prospects. It doesn't suffer the, the, the it doesn't kind of, you know, get the booms and the busts that other industries uh, tend to. Uh, experience uh, sometimes. I'm going to leave you with one thought, which is, is one word that I think we don't use enough when we're uh, kind of telling people about engineering careers, and that is fun. I think that engineering, if it appeals to you, if it appeals to you at all, I think it's the most surefire way to get paid for having fun. And the best illustration I have of that is a documentary uh, on YouTube called Pulling Power from the Sky. And most engineering documentaries are about the machines. This documentary is about particularly cool machines. Uh, you can see one of them hanging from a crane there. It's not quite an airplane. It's not exactly a drone, but it's something like that. But this documentary is about the people as well. And it's about the, the fun that they have and the emotional side. Of it. So it's kind of like a sports documentary uh, in some ways. And I would recommend uh, to, to take a few minutes to start watching it. And, I, I, and it, you know, it might, it might suck you in. OK, thanks very much for listening. Uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the day. There are some, I know there's some good stuff coming for you uh, for the rest of the day. OK. Nathan, Nathan, I'd like to say thank you so much for that. It's very, very informative and it's great to see some of these projects in action. Um, guys, we are going to take a 10 minute break now at the moment. So if you want to relax, grab a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and come back to us at 11.20. My colleague, Dr. Kevin Moorman, is going to talk to you about biomedical engineering. So please stay tuned or come back in 10 minutes time. We look forward to seeing you. Nathan, thank you.
All right, David, can you hear me okay? Perfectly, yeah. All right, this is loud enough if I speak like this? Yeah, that's perfect, yeah. All right, thanks. Um, so I'll, I'll mute again and we're back in five minutes, correct? Correct. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you very much for, for rejoining us and staying with us. Um, you're most welcome back. So it's my great honor to introduce you to my, to my colleague, Kevin Mormon, who's going to give a talk about biomedical engineering at NUI Galway. So Kevin, I'm going to hand it directly over to you. Okay, thank you very much. You can hear me okay? You can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'll get right started. Uh, so I'm going to talk about biomedical engineering and I'm a lecturer in that uh, group. First, I'm going to give you a bit of a taster lecture and then uh, talk about some of the programs that we offer. So my talk is entitled Frankenstein Design. Uh, you might know that movie or the book, uh, which is about recreating uh, a human being from all sorts of uh, spare parts and it ends up being a bit of a monster. But um, I'm going to talk about how biomedical engineers make new body parts. And our goal is not to make a monster, 
but our, our chief goal is to end disability, basically. And we do that by using science, physics, biology, and chemistry, as well as lots of maths, algorithms, and computer models, and fun engineering design. If you don't know Simona Geertz, that's the, the GIF on the right. Uh, I recommend you look her up on, on Twitter. It's quite, uh, she creates lots of funny contraptions. Anyway, so that's the, the, the purpose of biomedical engineering, to end disability. And we do that by coming up with all sorts of engineering designs, uh, solving medical problems. So that could be fractures of bone, uh, worn cartilage in the knee, so bad joints, or bad uh, uh, heart valves that need to be replaced, hip replacements, or whole limb replacements, uh, novel lenses, hearing aids. Safety of cars can be a biomedical problem to ensure that an occupant doesn't have an injury. Um, teeth and orthotic and prosthetic devices, of course, and neural implants. All these things are biomedical uh, engineering solutions. So one of the oldest examples, um, nearly, well, 1000 BC was a mummy where um, I think they had diabetes of the foot and they uh, developed an ulcer and lost the toe. And this mummy presented with um, a false toe. So that's a very early example of a prosthetic device. And later, uh, Edward Moybridge um, pioneered motion studies with these uh, very odd uh, motion capture videos. He actually demonstrated that the horse has a flight phase in its gait, as you can see here, using photography, uh, but also lots of weird uh, studies which you can find um, on, their, uh, on that website for Edward Moybridge. Anyway, that's how biomechanics kind of started. We still use motion capture. These markers were tracked using optical tracking with cameras. And then we train computer models to capture the motion of a subject, for instance, and that allows us to understand various clinical problems or to design orthotic devices or prosthetic devices as well. Um, but you might be more familiar with the, the motion capture stuff that you see in movies like Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit, where they use market tracking to control uh, another biomechanical model. In this case, it's sort of an avatar, like a, a 3D golem or other creature. But in, uh, with Frankenstein design, what we do we have to replace organs or body parts which are broken. So that, that presents itself with uh, unique engineering problems. For instance, you might have a heart, artery or lung problem, a kidney problem or a problem with your, your brain, for instance. If we're talking about the heart, how would one design a new heart or go about uh, fixing ailments of the heart? Well, an engineer typically starts designing by thinking of the geometry. What's the geometry? As you can see, it's very complex. So how do we assess this geometry? And then we need to think about the materials that we use, uh, what forces are acting on those materials, uh, what's the performance it needs. Obviously, it needs to be able to beat like uh, um, thousands of times and um, uh, valves and other devices that are in there. So can we just cut it out to study the geometry? You could, but usually people don't volunteer for that. So can, or can we just slice it up? Actually, this person did volunteer for that after they had uh, deceased, um, but that's also not very practical. So what engineers, biomedical engineers use instead is slicing uh, without cutting, using cutting edge technology such as uh, magnetic resonance imaging or other medical imaging techniques. So with that, we can study even flow and fiber tracks in the brain, for instance, all sorts of very interesting medical imaging techniques exist that give us the shape and geometry and the events that are going on in the body. So this, is, this was actually a pioneer project. Uh, based on such image data, we can segment the shape of the heart um, which will serve as the jump geometric input for um, computational models to design something. So yeah, next part then is to study what material to make our heart components from. Uh, a good start is to look at the biological material um, that is there in nature uh, because we should try to match that for instance. So then we do mechanical testing on them. Here there's hooks that pull out a little sheet of the material to figure out uh, how it deforms and we can then study stuff like the stress or force over area as a function of how it deforms and see that these materials really present with special mechanical properties. Um, so yeah, these heart, uh, pig and cow heart valves could be suitable replacement material, um, but we do notice that biological soft tissue presents with very odd deformations as demonstrated by this cute cat. Uh, these waves are actually called love waves. The, the, the person's last name was Love, who, who uh, discovered the, this particular type of wave. Um, some very cute uh, deformations of soft tissue happening there. Uh, this is less cute. So yes, yeah, soft tissue has is so full of water that it's very wobbly, yet very elastic. 
So it's, it's quite a complex engineering material if you think about it. It's not like steel or plastic or wood. Uh, well, wood is viscoelastic too, but it's much uh, simpler than these uh, soft tissues. So it presents challenges to model soft tissues because the heart has similar problems as this. Uh, we could cut it out and do tests like you saw earlier, but there's also medical imaging techniques that we can use. We can, we can cause a mini earthquake, if you will, at the surface of the chest. In this case, we're looking at the liver and uh, that passes waves of deformation through the tissue, which we can image using an MRI scanner. Actually, geophysicists use this. They cause like an explosion at a surface somewhere and they look at how waves are reflected. Here, this circular region, there's a stiffer inclusion and it causes the, the, the wavelengths to change. So by studying wavelengths, we can actually assess the mechanics of the tissue non-invasively without cutting them open as well. So on the right here is something called an elastogram, which is a picture of the stiffness. On the top is a healthy subject and the bottom is a fibrotic liver and you can see that the stiffness has gone up a lot. So we've non-invasive ways of looking at the mechanical properties as well. So what forces are acting on the, on the heart and on valves, for instance? How do we compute these? We create a computer model, uh, put in lots of mathematics and knowledge of the mechanical properties and the boundary conditions like flow and stuff it's subjected to. And then we could simulate it closing and then figure out what forces are acting on the material. Will it tear apart or how often can we do that? Uh, stuff like that. And this was again a research project uh, held in our university. So now we have this geometry, you know, thing or two about the materials and also the forces that are acting on it. So we're ready to start designing a heart valve. On the left is a normal heart valve. In the middle is a diseased one. You can see the dramatic change. And on the right is an artificial engineered one. I always like to imagine this one is sort of singing like, oh, oh, oh. It's, a, it's a funny little picture. Uh, but anyway, um, so now, next we need to figure out after you've come to such a design, does it, will it operate properly? Will it break? So we have to do an analysis of its performance to see if the, the struts, for instance, will be able to sustain the thousands and thousands of iterations it has to sustain. Okay, um, other examples are arteries, which might be clogged up in a process called stenosis. And to open them up again, we can put in a device called a stent. There's lots of medical device companies in and around Galway that produce stents as well. Uh, so we work closely with them. Um, this, I was hoping, yes, it's a simulation, uh, a PhD project from uh, our group uh, we use a balloon to inflate a stent that holds open the artery. And after the balloon is removed, um, you've therefore opened up the artery, restoring blood flow in that region. So that's the sort of thing that biomedical engineers do. Um, here it is, and you can evaluate it in bending as well in some locations in the body. All right, so that's the heart and arteries. There's also lots of skeletal applications to solving problems with biomedical engineering. For instance, a replacement knee we need, again, the geometry from medical image data, for instance. We need special types of materials that allow for a smooth interface to exist that doesn't create toxic wear particles in the body, for instance. And we need to compute the forces again. And sometimes we need to make physical models rather than computer models or train computer models using physical models. Uh, here we can put sensors in an instrumented uh, fake bone, if you will, and then validate or model with that. We can design all sorts of other, other body parts as well. On the right is actually a final year project. One of my students is doing a soft robotic. So you inflate this structure and it'll curve. So you could create replacement fingers or exoskeletons that you could wear on an impaired uh, region of the body. Finally, we also design entire limb systems. So uh, people might be familiar with these blade-like systems for, for running. Um, but th this is what the future holds, like mind-controlled devices. Imagine being able to use your mind to control a machine. And this makes me think of Avatar, the movie, where they have sort of an interface with an animal, but you could have sort of a USB cable connected to your car, for instance. And if you think drive, the car will drive. That could be the future, because here on the left, you can see we can control already um, artificial arms with our mind. And this is also a quick development. Uh, robotics are rapidly evolving, and these could, be, could become wearable robotics. On the left is the state-of-the-art exoskeleton that we have now, someone who's uh, quite paralyzed and legs can actually be helped to walk again with an exoskeleton. On the right is the vision in, in movies. We're not quite there yet, but actually the technology is developing quite rapidly. This is some work that I did uh, for my postdoc before I joined NUIG. This was at MIT. Um, for amputees, we designed new lower limbs and the key challenge was a socket. You can see this odd machine for determining the mechanical properties of the soft tissue. So we poke it, uh, measure the forces and train a computer model to reproduce those forces. 
Um, and then based on image data, we can sort of uh, design the perfect shoe for a subject, which is this uh, socket for an MPT. And then with 3D printing, the magic really comes to life and you can give it to a subject and test it. And this person came in and it was too painful to walk for them on their normal sockets. And when I produced the 3D printed ones, they walked again without pain. And that's very satisfying. That That's what, uh, what gets me out of bed in the morning, this type of thing, making people walk again with biomedical engineering. Another approach, and I, I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but tissue engineering is a massive new development in bioengineering and biomedical engineering. So the idea is to take a patient, take their cells and isolate the cells you're interested in and expand those cells, seed them on a biomaterial scaffold, for instance, a 3D structure, and then do tissue development. So we, we need mechanical stimulation. So the cells uh, learn what type of mechanical environment they're subjected to and then uh, give them the right nutrients and growth factors. And that will cause the cells to express a tissue type, perhaps similar to cartilage, for instance, that could go into the need to replace a cartilage defect. So um, there's lots of new developments there that we are actively working on as well. Uh, this is an interesting new um, um, capability, optogenetics. You could transfect with a virus, uh, a muscle or a nerve tissue and make it light sensitive. So in that way, if someone is paralyzed, you could restore muscle function by shining an intensive light at the nerves and make their legs move again. So imagine having a, some kind of suit with lights on it that could uh, go through the skin. Uh, this would avoid having to implant electrodes and all that. So there's lots of interesting developments in the biomedical engineering domain. So we've spoken about uh, biomechanics, prosthetics and artificial devices and organ systems, medical imaging, biomaterial developments, uh, tissue engineering, rehabilitation engineering, these exoskeleton suits, and um, all that is what biomedical engineering um, is. Now, are we finished? Well, not quite, because if we revisit our um, ancient mummy from thousands of years ago, um, that actually is still a problem. This was a diabetic foot ulcer. This is one of my projects currently, and I'm trying to get uh, new funding for this too. But a final year student is working on this, uh, a diabetic foot insole to prevent loathing that would cause ulcers from developing. So this is still a, a problem, and there's many exciting problems still to, to work on for biomedical engineers. Here we're trying to um, change the loading on the foot so that ulcers don't develop. For instance, using a 3D printed material that could have um, a soft material in a vulnerable region and a harder material in a region that isn't so vulnerable. All right, so that's um, in a nutshell, uh, biomedical engineering. Uh, so yeah, uh, become a biomedical engineer and help design a healthy future for all. I want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about how to become one? How, how do you become a biomedical engineer? So we offer a master of engineering program in biomedical engineering. Um, you could join, there's two entry routes. Um, one is the bachelor master of engineering and the other one is the bachelor of engineering on denominated. So you haven't quite made up your mind yet if, you, if you're choosing uh, biomedical engineering for this one. Um, so here's, you can find all these uh, requirements online as well, but the entry point requirements for 2020 were 509. Um, and this is an integrated bachelor master program, and I'll talk about that more uh, later. So you need a minimum grade of H5 in two subjects and passes in four other subjects, uh, which are listed here, and H4 in mathematics. And similar to the other programs, you can also pass uh, an engineering exam held at uh, the university to uh, fulfill that requirement. So what is this integrated masters? So the new standard in Europe for an engineering degree is this integrated master. So we move to this. And also it's what's required for applying for a chartered engineer title with Engineers Ireland. So that's why we've adopted it as well. So really what it is, is you have a common entry through CAO in first year and second year. Then in second year, the students decide if they want to go instead for the bachelor degree, which uh, gives a, uh, you have a, a placement in the, um, a four month placement at this point then, and then fourth year is your final um, uh, year and you graduate with your bachelor degree. But actually most students, 85% of students currently choose the uh, master's path. So then the placement is later. So you're, you're more skilled at that point. You have greater skill set to deploy in a longer project. And um, um, then you graduate in fifth year with your bachelor's and master's. Okay. Um, so what is the program? Well, it consists of 60% core engineering. So lots of that is common with the other engineering disciplines. 
because um, you need those skills to be able to tackle these complex uh, biomedical problems. And then 25% is core biomedical, so biomechanics, biomaterials, implant and device design, tissue engineering, and that sort of stuff. Um, then 10% is purely medical, so you need to have anatomical knowledge, uh, knowledge of physiology, pathology, and surgical practice. And the other 5% is communications and ethics. So this gives you a bit of a breakdown on, on what the degree uh, entails. Okay, and I just wanted to add that the, um, the fifth year uh, projects, these are really formulated in collaboration with clinicians, uh, hospitals, and medical device companies. So they address real clinical needs. And there have been some success stories where students have actually gone on to, to get funding for uh, starting a startup and to win awards for these projects. So they really involve um, a proper clinical problem that they can address. They do research and marketing research, they create a business plan, um, they work on design and manufacturing and testing as well. So that these projects are quite exciting for these uh, master's projects. And with that, I want to say um, thank you for your attention and um, let me know if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Kevin, for, you, for that very insightful thought. It was wonderful to give us so many examples of the different types of projects that you can get involved in in the area of biomedical engineering. And also, it's very, very interesting to note that bio, my, my biomedical engineering, similar to other engineers, it's not just the engineering that's important. It's the science, it's the medicine, it's the in integration with other disciplines in terms of business, in terms of communication. In your environment, it's probably a lot more in terms of the medical space as well, too, becomes very clearly important. But, but understanding from an engineering and computer science perspective, having this cross-functional integration perspective becomes very, very interesting. And it makes us better engineers, better practitioners, and hopefully better citizens. So, Kevin, thanks again for your talk. I very much appreciate it. Thanks. I'd like now to move forward to my colleague, if you don't mind, Maeve Duffy in Electronic and Electrical Engineering. And actually, we're going to have two presentations in this realm. Maeve is going to focus, I think, on the electrical and electronic space. And while her colleague, um, Professor Martin Glavin, is going to focus on electronic and the com computational side of some things. So Maeve, if you may, while you're setting up there, I'm just going to introduce you again. And you have about 10 minutes to talk to us about your world in this space. And thank you so much. OK, thank you, Catherine. Um, so I'm delighted to be able to talk to you today. Uh, just check you can hear me all OK. We can, Maeve, yeah, you're loud Great. and clear. Great, thanks, Catherine. So yeah, so I'm the programme director for the BEME in Electrical Electronic Engineering. And that's a sister program of the uh, electronic and computer engineering program, uh, which Martin Glavin will talk to you in a few minutes. Um, so I know you've heard a little bit about the, the GEEK project from uh, the talk on mechanical engineering earlier. Um, so, so I'm going to talk to you about how electrical electronic engineers fit into that. Um, so uh, the, the main role of the electrical electronic engineers in the GEEK is to design the, the electrical system that powers the GEEK. So the, the car is powered by a, a lithium polymer battery. It's a 10 amp hour, 25.9 volt battery, which is similar to the type of batteries that are used in electric bikes. Um, and that is used, it's connected to an, a DC electric motor um, and to control the amount of power that's provided to the motor, we use a power converter circuit. Um, and that's to enable us to control how fast the car goes, um, depending on whether or not it's going up a hill or on the flat. And the, the main function in the, in the Shell Eco Marathon competition is that we drive the car as efficiently as possible. So we're designing a power converter circuit here to convert electrical energy from the battery uh, to the motor as efficiently as possible. So just a little bit about how uh, motors work, because that's that's what electrical electronic engineers need to know as much as mechanical engineers. Um, so this is an equivalent circuit model for a DC motor. And here are some of the equations describing uh, its operation, its basic operation. You, you may well be familiar with that. Um, what you can see here is we've got speed uh, as omega 
and we've got voltage being applied to, uh, to the terminals of the motor. So we're supplying the motor with our battery and depending on how much current is drawn from the battery, the, the remaining voltage is left to drive the, the motor uh, at a particular speed. So you see here that the speed is directly proportional to the voltage that is produced across these terminals. So we can control the speed of our, our car uh, through controlling the speed of the motor by varying the voltage that we apply um, to the terminals of the motor. And now, depending on you know, whether we're going up a hill or we're, we're driving on the flat, we're going to have a different level of current drawn from the motor. And you can see that the motor equation relating current um, is it, it, you can see that the current depends on how much force or torque that the motor needs to overcome. So if we're running on the flat, then the torque is relatively low and the current that's drawn is, is, is relatively low. But then if we have to go up a hill, then the force is needed to overcome the weight of the car, the weight of the driver on the hill are higher. So we need to apply a higher torque. And what happens is you get higher current drawn from your motor. And as a result, there is less. That's that's a resistor here. So there's some voltage dropped across that and that causes the voltage on the terminals of your motor to decrease. So you slow down. So then the driver has to have a way of increasing uh, the voltage supplied onto uh, the motor to overcome that, because of course we have to complete the track within a certain uh, number of minutes. And um, so that's that's the basic equations governing a motor. And you'll see that I've uh, coloured the, the electrical quantities in green here. So we've got voltage feeding in and current being drawn from the motor against the mechanical properties of torque and speed. And you probably you may have seen before, but it's it's a you know it's, it's an electromechanical conversion device. If you check, you find that the, the the product of the current and the voltage feeding in, which is electrical power, is equal to the torque times the speed feeding out. So it converts electrical energy into mechanical energy. And um, so it's kind of like a magic device really um, but I mean we use it to great uh, purpose in the geek and indeed there's motors used all over the world um, in different applications but the trick is to be able to uh, specify size a motor to be as small as possible so that it'll uh, give you the required uh, range of speed and torque for for the purposes of um, in our case, it's the Shell Eco Marathon, and to do that as efficiently as possible. So then this is just a graph, so our students will be involved in testing different motors to ensure that they can indeed achieve that the speed that they need um, from the battery voltage that we have. The other big job of the electrical electronic engineer is to design the power converter circuit that will allow us to control um, the, the voltage, the battery voltage, of course, is fixed. Well, it, it remains more or less at 24 volts, but it, you know, it, it reduces as the battery is discharged. Um, but that we can provide a variable voltage to the motor so that if we're going on the flat and we want to go at a particular speed, we, we can set um, that speed. Or if we need to slow down because there's another car on the track or we're coming up to a corner, we need to be able to control the speed. So we've got a fixed DC voltage here and we need a variable DC voltage here. So what we do is we use this power electronics DC DC converter and basically what that does is it turns. The, it's like having a switch at this point that opens and closes very, very fast. And by varying the amount of time that you apply power to the circuit relative to the time that you turn power off, you can vary the average voltage that's been fed into these terminals. So if we turn on the motor for a very short time relative to the off time, we get a relatively low voltage applied here. And then if we want to go faster, then we turn we the, the driver will press uh, the, the accelerator effectively to allow the voltage uh, to, to be applied for a longer time relative to the off time. And then we get a higher output voltage and that allows the driver then to go faster. 
So it involves a lot of building and testing of circuits in the laboratory. And then once we're happy that the circuit is safe and efficient, um, then we integrate it into the car so we can test it with the, the rest of the, the system, um, including mechanical and electronic components. And then the last uh, bit is to, to, to use the motor and the motor drive circuit uh, to design an, an, an as, as efficient system as possible. So to do that, um, we take the data from all the other sensors that are on the system. So and Martin will talk to you about those in a minute, um, including temperature, speed, torque, GPS, and there may be others in the future. And we use uh, the information about our surroundings then to determine how to operate our power electronic circuit as best uh, we can so that we can get the most efficient operation of our car. Uh, so take the, the least amount of power for, from our battery while still achieving the speed that we need to complete the race. OK, so that's our um, contribution to the geek. Um, of course, the technologies that we're using can equally be applied in a lot of other areas. So the, the, uh, the BEME in electrical electronic engineering, it covers all the basics of electronic engineering, uh, analog, digital electronics, communication systems, some software, but the main focus compared to our sister program is on the electrical side, as, as you've seen in the geek. So we, we also design systems, you know, to convert mechanical energy from wind turbines into electrical energy uh, the, and the power converter circuits for those systems and PV systems and other emerging renewable energy sources. Um, other uh, vehicles, if you like, um, would, you know, the design of drones, the design of electric vehicles, full sized electric vehicles, um, electric aircraft, all the electrical systems in, in those components, as well as the, the, the communication systems and so on. Um, in terms of power processing of power, you know, you've got other battery operated devices like your mobile phone um, on one hand, um, and, and other portable devices like that. So there's a lot of um, design of electronic circuits, not just the power processing, but the information processing and the systems that allow um, us to communicate from, from, uh, from one person to another, uh, wired communications like the internet and wireless communications. And of course, a big area would be battery operated medical devices, whether they be worn devices externally or implanted uh, medical devices that, um, uh, that like pacemakers and so on. OK, so I hope that's given you a flavour of electrical and electronic engineering. Um, I'll introduce Martin Glavin, who's going to speak to you. He's programme director for uh, the programmes in electronic and computer engineering. Thanks, Maeve. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Martin Glavin, as, as Maeve says. I'm the Programme Director for Electronic and Computer Engineering, which is a sister programme of Electrical and Electronic Engineering. So I know the names sound very similar, and in, in many ways, the, the, the two programmes are quite similar. Um, as Maeve said, while Electrical and Electronic focuses on the electrical, the energy uh, management and storage and moving in terms of the electrical energy, um, electronic and computer engineering, a little bit more focused on computer design and communications and sensors. So we're, we're, we're more interested in the flow of data um, than necessarily the flow of energy. So can you move on there, Maeve, to the next slide? So um, I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about the system that monitors the, the geek car and show how um, each of the different stages of, of monitoring the vehicle echoes a lot of the things that are done within electronic and computer engineering. So while the car itself is, is hugely dependent on, of course, the frame and the, and the body so that you, you know, it's, it's strong enough and it's light enough to, be, to move around and that it's uh, aerodynamically efficient enough. And uh, in the electrical side, then you have the energy control, controlling the flow of energy to the, to the wheels from the battery through the motor and to the wheels. Um, so this is then where uh, electronic and computer engineering comes in as, as a, a helper technology, as an enabling technology for all of the other aspects of the vehicle. Um, and our role is to monitor the vehicle and turn that the, the information that we read from the vehicle into information that can be then used to refine it. And you see that we do this 
so in, in a huge number of different industries, I'll talk about this at, at the end, where we, we read from sensors, we process the data, we transmit it, we, we work on, on different ways of looking at the data, we communicate it, we write some software. So we're, we're, it's, it's very much a kind of a, an integration of, of a whole range of skills in electronic uh, and computer engineering. So the first thing is there's a lot of sensors on the car that read things like the flow of energy, like the, the speed of the rotation of the wheels, like where the, the car is. And once we have that flow of information, uh, we store that and maybe do some processing on the car. So we might just count the number of rotations of the wheel and then calculate, turn that into a, an actual speed in terms of kilometers per hour. Uh, and then we we transmit that data over the phone network. So uh, a very important part of electronic and computer engineering is the whole communications and the different technologies that are available and how to reliably and, and energy efficient uh, communication of, of information. Um, another aspect then is once it's transmitted, where does it, does it get transmitted to? Well, we send the information into the cloud uh, where we can then store it and archive it and we can timestamp it and we can we can uh, uh, keep it there as as a, 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 a huge store of information that can then be processed. We can go in and look at it and extract a lot of different uh, parameters about the vehicle once it's it's in the cloud. Um, we can then take it from the cloud and bring it down and we can uh, write a, a phone app. So if you want to design mobile phone applications, um, we have to go in and learn how to program those phones, how to take the information from the cloud, how to process the information, how to display it on the screen so that a person can zoom in on it and, uh, and get some information. So the idea is that if the car is driving around on the track, that we as the people in the pit lane, we can have our mobile phones out and maybe maybe Maeve is interested in the, the electrical energy and how the motor is performing. Maybe the guys in mechanical engineering are, are interested in uh, maybe there's a headwind on the track and how the aerodynamics are working. So we can provide lots of insights and lots of information to them. And then the results are visualized in real time. So there's there's real time updates uh, on, on the app. And this kind of flow of data is, is really representative of uh, a lot of what electronic and computer engineering is about. You just move on to the next slide, please, Dermot. So um, what I'm showing you here is some work that has actually been done by the, the students. So we have two students working on this, this aspect of the project. The first one is on the sensors and that the hardware side of things. So electronic and computer engineering is a very hands-on uh, type of engineering where we're getting the sensors, we're connecting them to, to things, we're, we're connecting the leads into little computer systems that we build ourselves and then we're programming them. Um, up on the top left there you can see a Hall effect sensor. So that's a, a little sensor that detects the, the, the motion of the wheel. So what we do is we put little magnets on the, on the wheel and as the wheel rotates and uh, these magnets pass by this Hall effect sensor and they generate little pulse. So every time the wheel rotates, we get a number of, of pulses from the wheel. And if we know the, the number of pulses, if we know the, the diameter of the wheel, then we can calculate the speed that the, the vehicle is traveling at. If we take a GPS sensor and we know where we are in the world, we can couple that with the speed and we know the speed that we're traveling at different parts. If we're going, let's say we're going around a, a racetrack. And then down on the bottom right hand side, you can see there is an, an energy sensor. It looks just like a, a little piece of electronics, but what we can do is take the, the current that flows um, from the battery through into the motor, and then we can turn that into signals that we can see on our, our computer, uh, our little, uh, what we call an embedded computer, uh, a little tiny electronic computer system uh, that uh, will take in all the signals, will uh, run them through programs, and then we'll try to extract something uh, meaningful from them. So if we move on to the next slide, then you can see circuits that the, the students themselves actually built. So on the top left hand corner there, um, that's where we have our, our little computer system. Um, on the right hand side, you can see the little terminals. There's orange terminals there that show where the, the energy comes in from the power electronics on the left hand side uh, of, of, the, of the diagram. Um, you can see there's lots of green wires or if, if you're on the top right hand panel there you can see it comes in from the right hand side. There's uh, signals that come in from the various sensors that are connected on the vehicle and you can see the little circuits that the, the students have connected together and if you look down at the bottom there then you can see all of the just kind of a, a side view from each of the, the inputs. Um, so the, the students are getting hands on with the circuits and that's a, a really important thing in, in the electronics world is that 
you really have to work with the real hardware. You have to see the signals coming in. You have to uh, build these projects. And that's the thing that, that is, is a very strong theme throughout the, the, the program of electronic and computer engineering. We're always building little circuits, programming them, trying to get uh, get them to to do various different things, whether whether it be to display information, whether we're um, creating game gaming type applications, whether we're looking at robotics applications, um, it's it's a very hands on and a very very kind of a, a tactile type of of engineering. So if we move on to the next uh, stage. So this is really the the value that that we add to the likes of the Geek project. Up on the top or on the left hand corner there, left hand side, you can see an overview of the track that we were at uh, a couple of years ago um, and the car is ready to drive around that track. On the right hand side, then you can see an output, a typical output from our, our software and you can see the little loops of the of the track there. So um, there's a number of different panels and each each one of them is a different lap that the vehicle has gone on, but you can see there are some red and orange and yellow portions and that shows where the energy has been consumed. And the really nice thing from, from the, the overall geek perspective is we're engineers, we're constantly trying new things, we're constantly trying to improve, we're constantly trying to refine our system to make it more energy efficient. But when we make a change, we want to see and we want to be able to measure and quantify uh, by how much we've made the system better. Maybe we've made it worse, we don't know. But with the data, we can uh, learn an awful lot about the performance of the system. And that's really the power uh, of using electronic and computer engineering because you can take these values, the position, you can take the current, the voltage, you can take the wheel speed, you can take the temperatures of the various different things pull all that information in, store it, process it, and then output it. And then we can learn an awful lot about the vehicle and we can use that data. And with once you have data, uh, then you, you have a, an awful lot of power because you can then really understand uh, the, the nuances and the intricacies of the system. So um, just moving on to the, the next slide there, just to show you some, some other, sorry, just the, the previous one there. Maybe. Just some other applications of electronic and computer engineering. So the top left hand side there, it's a, an example of a, a, an operating theater and it, it looks kind of more like a space station when you consider the amount of electronic systems that are in there. They assist the doctors in diagnosis and Kevin showed you all the different ways that the scanning technologies, the processing, the output, uh, all done with electronic sensors. You're communicating the, the information, you're processing the information, you're viewing the information, just like what we're doing with the, with the Geek. Um, even the system that's shown here, you don't even have to be in the same room as the patient in order to conduct an operation. In fact, you don't even have to be in the same continent as the patient, because with a lot of sensors, with cameras, with all the various different sensors that are used, and with a, a very fine control, uh, you can actually have a surgeon in America operating in a patient in Ireland remotely using uh, by communicating the information over the internet. On the top right hand corner, you can see mobile phones. Mobile phones are really powerful, portable computing platforms, uh, and they're a, a very important part of, kind of modern society, whether it be uh, the likes of the LinkedIn and all the various social medias, uh, uh, social media uh, 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 applications that are used, but we can also use them to monitor systems, we can also use them to record data, we can use them to visualize stuff. Um, so they're a really useful resource that that, uh, that electronic computer engineers uh, program and work with uh, and, and use. On the bottom left hand side, there's a kind of a huge revolution in our artificial intelligence uh, and uh, this is going to become a, a huge growth area, I think, for technology in general and we're going to see an awful lot more about smarter devices being deployed. And I suppose a good example of that is the bottom right hand side, which is um, autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles and sensors in the environment and the Internet of Things is really going to change the world because we're going to be generating more and more data. The, we're going to need far more sensors. We're going to need computers um, pretty much on, on every aspect of life, whether it be farming, transportation, whether it be um, uh, medical uh, applications. Everything is going to be more connected together. We're going to need, we're going to be generating vastly more uh, data. We're going to need to communicate that data. We're going to need to store. We're going to need to process that data. And then we're going to need to use algorithms to try to make sense and to make use of that data so that uh, we do have safe autonomous vehicles, that we do have 
uh, longer living, uh, uh, people living with better quality of life because of all the sensing and all the processing and, and, and all of the management of our health. So there's lots of, uh, of different applications. So I suppose the message for, the electron for people who are considering electronic and computer engineering is that we're developing a lot of the key enabling technologies um, that allow so many other aspects of life to uh, to to happen, uh, and you can see lots of the other engineer engineering um, uh, genres. Uh, they use so much electronics nowadays in their in their work. Um, so really, it's kind of you know you can be a user of the technology or you can be a designer of the technology, and that for me is the is the the real kind of um, gold in all of this. The fact that you can be a designer of this new and, and exciting technology that every single person on the planet is going to benefit from. So that's a really cool thing to to, to think of. Okay, with that, I'll hand uh, back to Catherine. Thank you so much, and thanks everyone for your time, and thanks for listening. Martin. What a positive ending. It's wonderful and it's really, really great to see the amount of opportunities that are opening up in that space. So, Martin, I'd like to say thank you very much for your, your help in this area. And also as well, too, by the way, May, we haven't forgotten you. Thanks very much for being a great tag team. And, and guys, your conversation lends itself very, very well and dovetails very nicely into our next speaker. Um, you find that much of our conversation so far has focused on the engineering side of things. But one of the key nuggets, I suppose, that we've tried to put across all the time is the importance of managing information and information systems. So I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Dr. Sam Redfern, who works in the School of Computer Science. Um, and Sam is going to spend a, a little bit more time talking about, I suppose, what happens there in the area of both computer science and information technology. And I think you're going to be very interested in Sam's own personal research area as well, too. It will resonate well with you. Sam, it's up to you now. Thanks, Catherine. Um, can you see my screen? We can and we can hear you as well. Thank you. Perfect. Excellent. Hi, so I'm going to take you through a somewhat personal journey through my teaching in computer science. Um, so I'm, I'm lucky enough to actually teach in all four years of the degree. Um, um, and my focus is on digital media and games. So here's our building. We're on the edge of the river on a very nice uh, spot. Uh, and we're quite sizable. We've got quite a big school of computer science and, it, and it's actually expanding uh, quite fast at the moment. So we have a lot of work going on on software development, um, programming, artificial intelligence, digital media, all those kind of things. Um, so my own particular specialism, as I said, is digital media. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this, so don't worry about that. I'm really just trying to show you where my own teaching fits in, because as I said, I'm kind of taking the approach of giving a personal flavor. Um, so computer science is a four-year degree and um, a lot of my colleagues cover the kind of background programming and technology um, you know programming languages and all that kind of stuff whereas my own teaching is over on the right hand side i've made the font bigger um, so i fit into what's called problem-based learning um, where i suppose rather than covering the technologies in themselves i kind of take the problem first I say, here's an interesting problem that we want to try and solve. Here's an interesting project that we want to try and do. Uh, how do we do that? So it's kind of reversing the way of learning and it's a really nice way of learning. Um, so I could focus on digital media. So in first year, I focus on web development. Um, throughout the kind of core of second year and third year, I do a lot of game development, which is a particular passion that I have myself. Um, and then we get a bit more theoretical again in fourth year. Um, so, yeah, over the next few slides, I'm, I'm literally going to show you kind of some highlights of the stuff that I do throughout the four years. So starting with first year where I'm teaching web development um, and I try and focus as much as possible on fun problems and animation and particularly problem solving because programming is all about problem solving. Um, so this uh, again, it's kind of an adjunct to what my colleagues are doing. They're teaching the kind of nuts and bolts of programming where I, I'm kind of taking interesting problems and using them as additional practice. Um, so what I'm going to focus on in particular is this idea of a calendar because that's that's a really nice um, little set of related problems, actually building a calendar like this. Um, and it allows us to kind of talk about in class what algorithms are, uh, algorithm being a computer a computerized solution to a problem. Um, so these, these are actually literally a couple of slides out of some of my lectures here. Um, so we kind of go through the steps of how would you build a calendar like this? How would you build a table like this in a web page using code? So kind of programmatically building it. 
Um, and I'm, I'm kind of focusing on what are the key aspects here. You know, we, we use a loop, so we kind of repeatedly draw a cell. Um, and in fact, there's three loops when you look at this, and this is kind of breaking down the problem. So there's the, the, the four gray cells at the top, and then there's the big bulk of blue cells, and then there's the three gray cells at the end. So it's kind of breaking that down into three separate concepts and saying, how do we actually identify these things? Um, And then, and then I kind of get, we kind of talk about the technicalities of doing that. So we're saying, how do we actually code this up in, in HTML, JavaScript? Um, I then continue this problem. We kind of step back and say, okay, now let's say we've told the computer how many days are in the month and what the first of that month is. Um, surely we can actually calculate these things too, you know, in order to fully automate the, the um, building of a calendar. And of course we can. So um, the first thing we focus on is how many days does a month have? And this is actually an interesting uh, little algorithm because, of course, we all know that, that the rhyme 30 days has September. That's actually an algorithm. It's giving us a set of steps um, for identifying how many days are in a month. So I've, I've literally got, you know, the, the, the rhyme in there. So I've got April, uh, I've got September, April, June, November. I return 30 for them. So there's 30 days in them. If it's not one of them, then is it not February, in which case it's 31. OK, so literally all other months apart from February. Um, and then that kind of leaves us with the difficult one, which is February. And that again allows us to discuss and kind of drill down into February and what is that's unique about it. And of course it's leap years that's unique about February. Um, Cause on a leap year, you've got 29 days, otherwise you've got 28. So that kind of leads us to say, what is a leap year? Um, and there are specific rules for leap years. Uh, most people don't know them all. Um, as it turns out, there's three main rules. I'm aware of three rules. Um, I'm not going to lift to 400, so I don't need to know any more than that. There may be more rules that I don't even know about. Um, so every fourth year is normally a leaf year, but if it's divisible by 100, then it's not. But actually, if it's divisible by 400, then it is. Um, so the year 2000 was an interesting one, and one of the millennium bugs was based around the fact that rule three had not been programmed into software by people. Um, so we, we kind of talk about all this stuff in class, and then um, the students implement the code for this and we talk about how they've done it and you know, look at solutions to it and that kind of thing. So it's, it's about, I suppose, learning how the algorithms fit in and how you plug them together into a useful piece of software. Um, so again, this is just kind of revising and going back to saying how do we actually plug the isLeap component into the number of days component. Um, and finally, we say, how, how do we know what day of the week our month starts on? And, and again, once we start looking at the rules and getting logical about it and breaking them down, we can actually see there's, there's a system there that we can program. And that's, that's again what programming and algorithms are all about. So I, I basically give, give the class a fact, which is January the 1st, 1900 was a Monday. Um, given that, with a bit of clever thinking, we can actually work out what the date, what the first of any month in any year after January 1900 was and it's all about calculating how many days have passed so we literally write code that that calculates how many days have elapsed between January the 1st 1900 to now or to the uh, to the to the first of a given month in the year 2021 so it's going to be tens of thousands um, and then we can just identify the fact that we that it loops around every seven days is just a repeat so once we figure out how to do that and it really isn't that hard we can go ahead and do it um, so that's, that's the kind of logic behind what I'm doing there. Um, so it's trying to make the problems interesting. It's trying to make them real, and it's you know making actually actually useful software while practicing the whole all the skills that are needed. Um, so I won't spend quite as much time on the other years. I'm kind of focusing on uh, the early years first of all. So in second year, I teach a module in two two dimensional games development. So I'm using a language called Java, which is a one of the most well, we focus on a lot of the most popular languages. Java is hugely widespread in industry, so it's a great language to learn. Um, so one of my, again, one of my colleagues is actually teaching Java at the same time in, in a more traditional way. Um, so they're covering the components of the language and how you use them and what you do with them. Um, whereas again, I kind of flip it around and I say, hey, get, hey, let's make Space Invaders. Um, what do we need to do in Java in order to make Space Invaders? Um, and in particular, I focus on the data because it's kind of the thing that you get into by second year is you're you're getting a bit more advanced at solving problems. And then you start saying, you know, how do we actually structure the data for these complex problems? Um, and that becomes a kind of a focus in this as well. But again, with a, with a focus on games. Um, so I do a little bit of procedural generation. So we, we look at code that can generate these kind of cave like systems or these kind of pseudo natural 
looking results, which is one of the interesting things you can do with graphics. Um, and I also look at pathfinding, which is a very interesting problem. And it's a um, very, very clever solution to this is, is an algorithm called ASTAR. Um, so we spend a couple of weeks studying ASTAR and it's again a great opportunity to, to practice solving these types of problems and how do you put the code together, how do you store the data, how do you access the data, all these, these are all the things you need to be to know to be a software developer. Um, so if you've ever wondered in a game how you can run around a pretty complex map or a maze and how the computer enemy can actually chase you, um, how do they find their way around the walls? This is ASTAR, this is exactly what you use in games. Um, so again, I don't want to get into too much detail here, but this is what we do in class. We kind of, we pose the question, what data do we need? What's appropriate to solving this problem? Um, having studied the, the A-star algorithm kind of theoretically, we say then, how do we break this down? What data do we need? Um, how do we initially set it up? Then how do we do our, our looping step? How, what, what kind of repeating tests can we do and what's needed in order to make progress towards the solution? Um, and again, that's, that's exactly what programming is all about. Um, so what's the initial step? What's the general step? How do we know when we're finished? And then how do we use the data we've produced? Um, so this is all very rich ground for, um, you know, for studying all the components of computer science that my colleagues are covering in, in a more abstract way. So how do we store the data? What's the appropriate way of doing that? How do we make use of it? Um, Okay, so that's second year. Uh, in third year, I'm lucky enough to have a module on 3D games development. Um, and this one is not directly supporting any other module. So I, I really um, get the opportunity to do loads of interesting stuff here. So we use the Unity game engine, which you may have heard of. Um, the class, of course, are getting quite advanced to programming at this stage. So we really can do some pretty cool stuff. Um, and I actually bring a lot of my own games here. Um, I've spent my whole life making computer games, so I have a lot of them and that, that really gives a, a rich set of examples and code and graphics and all the things that go into, into games, um, which I get pretty excited about and the, some of the class do too. So here's some of my recent games for uh, the last 15 years or so. There's the kind of logos for them and some gratuitous screenshots from them. Um, so it, it's, it's about 2014, I'm using Unity, but I've been through all kinds of other languages and game engines and stuff in the in the in the previous as well. Um, this is just one quick example of how we we kind of use an, an example from a game I've worked on to study a computer science topic. So here we're talking about composition, which is where we build game objects out of a collection of behaviors. So that tree, for example, you can see has got a shadow. You can probably see it's a two-dimensional tree as well. So it's you know. There's no automatic shadowing going on here. And you can see the character standing in front of it also has a shadow and there's a fire which is causing the shadows to be cast. Um, so composition is about saying a tree has some similarities with that character in that it casts shadows, but it's got differences as well. So it's about composing the game objects out of these kind of reusable um, components, these re reusable behaviors. Um, so that's, that's a nice example of how, I suppose the game development is reflecting back onto the computer science and is giving good examples and good practice of, of computer science. This is just some quick examples of student projects that have been done over the years in this course. Um, so we've had a load of interesting games. A lot of people tend to do puzzle games. Um, up on the top left there, we've got some kind of a war game. Obviously we've got pool up there on the top right, which lends itself very nicely to an engine like Unity because we have a physics engine built into it. Um, and pool, of course, is primarily about the physics of the balls moving around. Um, so we have a lot of fun doing that, and like, I'm often amazed by the, the quality of games that students are producing. Again, bearing in mind by third year, they're quite good at programming, so it's really a great time to do a game engine rather than doing it too early when they don't really understand the basics. This is just a quick look at fourth year. So in fourth year, I teach a course called Graphics and Image Processing. Um, and here we really start looking at the, uh, I suppose, the underlying fundamentals. We start saying, how does your graphics card work? Um, how do these clever algorithms, how does this, these clever pieces of software draw realistic looking pictures? How do they draw the shadows? How do they draw the light? Um, so it's about studying how those things go on in computer graphics software. Um, and at the same time, the other half of the course is image processing, which is a, uh, it's a study of how you can have computers analyze images and derive useful information from it. Um, so that's pretty interesting too. And like all my other courses, I, I slip in some games here and there. 
Um, I never go too far without talking about them. Um, I should have mentioned actually back in third year, just down at the bottom, I've listed the games flat. There's there's a uh, a nationwide um, undergraduate games festival and competition on every year in Tipperary, and I've a number of years I've brought students down to it and entered, and we've we've won prizes a few times as well. So that, that's really exciting, and it's really nice to meet other students from around the country that are studying games, game development. Um, so some years I've done that depending on interest. Um, and there you go, a quick run through, kind of a personal flavor, I guess, of uh, my teaching in computer science. Thank Sam, you. thank you very much for that. It was Sam. Yep, yeah, sorry, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that conversation. It was really interesting and it was great to see. I think I really enjoyed the focus as well, too, on your own personal interests. Yeah. Because today we're going to get a flavour of so many different academics and we're trying to give as much as we possibly can about the various different disciplines. But I think if you show in, we're all almost like sole traders in our own area and we're all highly interested and invested in our own specific research space. So it's really nice to get an overview of what and um, an an academic does, and of course, how is she he or she can bring that into the programs and courses in which we deliver. Yeah. So that's so really really good. And I'm very very conscious that much of our conversation today has focused on engineering orientated, and we have emphasised the importance of computer science and managing information throughout those pro projects and programs as well too. But it's also very, very important to highlight that we have a full school of computer science. And as Sam has identified, your school is getting bigger and bigger all the time. In fact, so big you have to form your, your own school in that space. So it's really encouraging and it's great to see. And there are so many opportunities from that school as well too, you know, in, in terms of employment, in terms of research and, and also, of course, working with all of the other disciplines. Because regardless of what we do, we don't do anything in isolation. We need our friends in, in other faculties and other spaces to help make what we do happen. So, so Ta Sam, I think your talk has been very, very good and very, very insightful in that space. Thanks, and I thank Catherine. you for that. Thank you. So now I'm going to hand you over to another one of my colleagues. This is Dr. Rory Monaghan. And Rory has very much championed the energy system space in engineering. We have a program in energy systems engineering and also, of course, you know, a lot of the energy systems and sustainability transcends a lot of the other programs that are there too. So Rory, thank you for joining us today. Um, I see the geek is cropping up again, which is fantastic because it's a great example of, of how, we, to use yeah. one particular example of how many disciplines can work from it and what we can do giving us something very, very tangible and something that's very easy for us to understand and digest. So, so Rory, thanks again for coming today and I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks, thanks very much, Catherine. I'm delighted to be here and um, hello everyone. So I'm Rory Monaghan. I am what's called the program director. Uh, so the person in charge of our energy systems engineering program. So NUI Galway is one of only two universities in Ireland that runs an undergraduate energy systems engineering program. So uh, I'm going to take you through some of what motivates this. I'm not going to go into huge detail on what's in the class. I just want to give you a flavor for why we run it, uh, what our students are like and uh, what you could do afterwards. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to delve into the geek. So, you know, you've 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 seen the mechanical aspects of the geek, the electrical aspects of the geek, the electronic and computer aspects of it. And now I'm going to talk about the energy systems because at its heart, the event that the geek participates in, the Eco Marathon, is all about energy efficiency. So why do cars need energy? Why does any transportation system need energy? And how can we pick the best possible energy system? And what do we need to consider? OK, so why energy systems engineering? Well, it's certainly it's 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 gaining um, a kind of a topical cachet at the minute, energy systems and engineering. Climate change, uh, environmental pollution have been on everyone's minds recently, and I think particularly uh, in 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 the last couple of years, it's come to the fore. And um, energy security, Ireland imports most of its energy from overseas, almost all of that coming from the United Kingdom, which is now has left the European Union. So, what does that mean in terms of how secure our supply of energy is? Could we make more of our own? 
In the grand scheme of things, we are going to run out of fossil fuels. Uh, the question is, will we find something better before that happens? There's issues around social justice and equity surrounding access to energy. There are billions of people around the world who don't have access to reliable forms of energy. And energy has been shown to be the number one determinant of whether um, uh, uh, people's um, quality of life improves access to reliable forms of energy. And then also there's cost. The cost of energy fluctuates all over the place. So that has got an impact on, on people's um, ability to, uh, to, lead, to lead full lives. Well, I'm just going to play a, uh, hold on a second. We're going to get rid of this pointer for a sec. I'm just going to, um, sorry, I'm going to reshare my screen because I don't think I have um, enabled uh my sound to be played so just bear with me one second i just want to play a quick motivating video and hopefully you'll hear the sounds about energy systems engineering <laughs> So the guy at the top of the wind turbine is unfortunately not me, although I'd love to do that, I haven't yet had the chance to. But what I'm really trying to get at here is aside from the, the climate imperative, the social justice imperative, the energy security, there is a very pragmatic view that, that we should all be aware of, and that's that Europe's recovery will be green. The recovery from COVID has been, has been plastered all over the place by the European Union, by the United States, by China that the recovery will be green. We're not going to return to the same societies, to the same energy systems that we had before the pandemic. Anything new that's built has to be low carbon, has to be zero carbon. The European Union um, has committed to what's called net zero, so zero carbon emissions by 2050, which is going to be a huge challenge. China, the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world, is committed to net zero by 2060. And it looks like the US is going to make a similar pledge as well under its new government. So the world is undoubtedly going to need energy systems engineers. And this is just a snapshot of recent headlines around renewables and energy storage and hydrogen energy that's thought, that, that have come up in recent years. So I won't dwell too long on this, but um, energy systems engineering in common with all other forms of engineering being taught at NUI Galway is uh, there are two routes to enter. There's the undenominated route shown on the left hand side there, or there's the direct entry route from the CAO. So that's GY413 is the energy um, CAO code. So um, whether you do undenominated or direct entry energy systems engineering, you end up doing the exact same program. We have a um, we have an end, an exit point after year four uh, with a bachelor's, what's called level eight, and as has been described by many others, we also have the level nine bachelor, uh, the level nine masters qualification after five years, and this is the new European standard, the uh, the new world standard for um, for engineering education. And essentially staying for the fifth year, getting your master's, getting a level nine qualification means that you have a no questions asked, internationally accepted passport of your engineering qualification. And it just opens more doors and it opens doors quicker. So where will you work? Well, this is again a snapshot from surveying of our graduates of where they end up working. And you can see it is across the board within the energy sector, uh, renewables, traditional forms of energy, electricity, nuclear, um, and then a number of companies that you wouldn't necessarily associate with energy, Accenture, um, Texas Instruments. So our graduates are employed across the engineering spectrum and in many cases go on to do great things in research positions in universities around the world. This is just a little image of um, one of our graduates. You can just see him here. His name is Colm O'Rourke. And he, after he graduated with a bachelor's in energy systems engineering here, he went to MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he joined this cool team called the, Hyper, the, the MIT Hyperloop, which was developing these um, really 
fast personal mobility uh, pods that are sucked along in vacuum tubes. So 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 he's he's gone on and he's just finished his uh, his doctorate in in engineering at MIT now. Who will you meet? Well, we're really uh, fortunate to have an incredible group of students that are studying energy systems engineering, and they have formed their own society. There, there, you know, there is there is an engineering society, but there is also a very, very large, very active energy society, and they um, organize events. This is some some of the events that they do. They organize a um, annual conference and it's really professionally run here's a here's some screenshots of it they had the energy minister at it a few years ago of the the head of the irish wind energy association so they really get some heavy hitters to come to galway and they get great exposure to the energy industry while they're doing that they go on trips overseas they've been to the german institute for solar energy they've been to the the um european nuclear energy agency in brussels they've been to energy villages in denmark and through, uh, throughout ireland so they really are very very active and you know if you come here even if you don't do the energy systems program, I'd encourage you to connect with these students. They're, they're, they're an inspirational bunch to be around. But what I want to spend the rest of my talk going through is the energy aspects of the geek. So it's not that we're all trying to poach each other's territory here between mechanical engineering, electrical and electronic and computer. But what we're really trying to show here is that projects like the geek, which are only run at NUI Galway, are they sort of transcend all engineering and and this is really the purest example that I'm aware of of engineers from lots of different backgrounds working together and doing something absolutely amazing so this is us at the eco marathon in London in 2019 and unfortunately there hasn't been event there, there wasn't an event in 2020 and it's unlikely to be an event in 2021 so why would engineers be interested in tackling the transportation problem well, in Ireland as a country, we spend three billion a year on transportation fuels. That translates to about 2000 euros per car. Obviously, it depends on how far you travel. And 95 percent of that energy is is um, is imported fossil fuels. Ireland does not produce any of its own oil. And all of that comes from uh, either the UK, Norway or sometimes further, further afield. It's a huge contributor and growing, fastest growing contributor to our greenhouse gas emissions. And something that we're learning more and more about is the, the health problems to do with um, combustion driven cars, not just from a greenhouse gas point of view, but from these particulates and these NOx emissions that are really detrimental to people's health. And um, what's been found is that people that grow up in areas with poor air quality, primarily down to traffic and down to solid fuel burning, are having worse outcomes with COVID-19. Um, and that's because their immune systems have been suppressed before they get COVID-19 and their respiratory systems are at risk. So why do we need energy to drive a car? Well, it all comes down to forces. It comes down to the force. A car must provide traction force to overcome three key forces. And when Nathan was talking to you about the mechanical engineering program, he went over some of these forces. These key forces that an, that an energy systems engineer has to be concerned about are the drag forces, or getting getting the uh, pushing the air out of the way of the car, the inertial force of getting the car up to some speed, and the rolling resistance, the 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 kind of what we call the squidginess of the tires against the road. So at minimum, we need the traction provided by some energy system within a car, whether that's from the burning of fuels or the the release of energy from batteries to make that car move forward. Also, we need energy to provide other things, heating, cooling, entertainment, safety systems for the car too. So breaking it down to it, it's most it's most simplistic level. Kinetic energy is what we need to add to the car to get it from a from a resting point up to some speed of travel. And this is how we can we can uh, we can um, quantify the kinetic energy required to get a car up to some speed when it's starting from rest. OK, so this is something that you've maybe seen in your science classes or in your physics classes in recent years. And then when the car is up and running, other forces start to become important. So kinetic energy is needed to get the car moving and to keep the car moving. We need energy to to overcome drag force and rolling resistance force. And as engineers, we can come up with simple mathematical expressions or what we call models to 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 show what the key factors that drive 
drag force, which is what Nathan Quinlan was talking to you about earlier, and rolling resistance, which is the squidginess effect of tires on roads. This is this is if you're if you're cycling a bike with a flat tire, it's this this factor here that makes the uh, that makes the bike harder to cycle. So when we when we when we put our drag force and our rolling resistance together, we multiply it by a distance traveled. We get an energy that's required to keep the car moving, and we'll call this the traction energy. This is the mechanical energy needed to to fight against a force of this size over a distance d. And when we start thinking of the journey as a whole, and this is this is what energy systems engineers do, we try and think of the the whole system, the whole thing coming together, the electrical, the mechanical, the when we talk about buildings, the civil aspects of of energy systems coming together, we can calculate an energy expression for an entire car's journey. OK, so this is the minimum energy needed to make a car accelerate up to some speed uh, V to keep it moving against drag force of air and to keep it moving against the rolling resistance of a road. So how important are each of these terms? Well, if we're traveling a distance, if our D is one kilometer, and if our average, if our cruising speed is 40 kilometers an hour, 80 kilometers an hour, 120 kilometers an hour, this is the breakdown between our three um, um, energy terms that we have to overcome, the inertia, the drag and the rolling resistance. So you see, to get up to high speed, we need lots of inertia. We have to overcome that kinetic, that, that, that inertia of the car to add kinetic energy to the car. Drag then becomes important, rolling resistance less so. If we're going 10 kilometers, we see that the inertia becomes less important because now we're driving at speed for much longer. The, the, the speeding up part is less important. Or 100 kilometers, now we see that the inertia is more or less is 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 invisible, OK? And if we're driving um, halfway to Dublin on the motorway at 120 kilometers an hour, this is how our energy breakdown looks. So we're mostly overcoming drag and some rolling resistance. So depending on the journey we take and the speed we drive at, energy systems engineers need to target their efforts to overcome different types of losses in a car, right? So if we're driving short distances at low speed, these three factors are more or less equal. So if I, as an energy systems engineer, I'm tasked with improving the energy efficiency of a car, I'll know that I need to give equal priority to each of these each of these terms. However, if I'm tasked with um, uh, improving the energy efficiency of, say, a truck that's going to be delivering freight from Galway to Dublin, I'm looking at this. I need to say, well, how do I improve the drag performance of the truck? Maybe do something on the roller resistance, but I really don't care about the inertia because it doesn't it doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned. So where does the energy come from that has to that has? Uh, uh, so what's the what's the source of this energy that we need to um, overcome that we need to use to overcome the inertia, the drag and the rolling resistance? Where does it come from? The first law of thermodynamics, courtesy of Albert Einstein and others, tells us that we cannot create or destroy energy, except in certain circumstances. We can only change it from one form to another. So what is that form that we use? Two key considerations have to be brought into play when we, uh, when we think about the best source of energy for a car. Energy and power, and they're not the same thing. And if you come here and study energy systems engineering, that's one of the first things I'm really going to be trying to drive home, is that energy and power mean two very different things. They're related, but they've got different meanings. So energy supply have to have to satisfy these two criteria. The car has to be able to practically carry enough stored energy to conveniently make a journey. OK, so this is energy. This is the bigger my fuel tank size, the more energy I can store and the further I can drive. The more efficient my, ener uh, my engine is, the further I can drive on that same amount of energy. An engine must be able to convert the stored energy to kinetic energy fast enough to enable adequate acceleration. So this is the size of the engine. This has nothing to do with efficiency or nothing to do with the size of the fuel tank. It's all to do with how fast I can take that stored energy and put it into the form of kinetic energy to keep the wheels moving. So energy and power are my two key criteria. If I have a petrol driven car, I have a fuel tank, the size of which determines the amount of energy I've stored. I have an engine, the efficiency of which determines how much of that fuel energy makes it to the wheels. The size of it determines how powerful the car is. 
And some of that energy, a very, very small fraction in the case of a petrol car, about one fifth of that energy makes it to the wheels to turn the wheels. The other 80% is lost as heat, right? That's why the bonnet of a car feels hot. That's why exhaust comes out at high temperatures. So we lose most of our energy when we, when we use petrol or diesel. If we use a battery, however, the battery, the size of which determines the stored energy, the rate at which we discharge the battery determines how fast we deliver that energy. We, we now no longer do any burning in the car. We transfer the electrical energy released from the battery to a motor. Now, motors are way more efficient than combustion engines. So we can expect maybe 70, maybe 80% of the energy leaving the battery to make it to the wheels. So we, we can already see that the, 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 the electric car is far more efficient. But how powerful is the electric car? So let's look at very, very briefly in the last minute I have available, how we would put a, a, a drivetrain together. And we'll take a car the size of a Volkswagen Golf. So if we were to put the parameters of Volkswagen Golf in, we'll find the amount of energy we need to drive the car. If we assume that 75% of that energy is wasted, if we uh, of of the end of the engine and petrol is wasted, if we if it's a petrol driven car, here's how much energy and petrol we need. This will allow us then to size an engine, to size a fuel tank, and overall to come up with how heavy the 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 energy and power system of a car needs to be. I'm going to skip by this a little bit, but this is basically allowing us to size the the, the engine for power, not just for energy. So we end up with a number of the minimum size of the energy system for a Volkswagen Golf driven by petrol is 118 kil kilograms. Is this big or small? Well, we can go through and do the exact same calculation for an electric car, for a diesel car, and for what's called something called a hydrogen fuel cell car. And if our car needs to travel 1000 kilometers, this is the mass of the energy system that we can get in each of those four scenarios. So we see that if a car needs to travel 1000 kilometers, Petrol is the lightest power plant, but how many cars need to travel a thousand kilometers in one go? Not many. If we say that a car instead travels a much more representative distance of 100 kilometers, we see a totally different scenario and the electric vehicle becomes by far the most efficient energy system, followed by the fuel cell vehicle, which is something else I didn't have time to get into. But this is only the kind of the beginning of the of of the of the situation with transport. Trucks, buses, airplanes, these are totally different systems with, which will need a fully different way of decarbonization. There's no one size fits all approach here. What about the volume of the engine? What about the environmental performance? What about the cost of these things? All of these need to be considered by engineers and that's the role of energy systems engineers. So with that, um, I'll finish up and uh, thank you for your attention and pass it back over to Catherine. Rory. Thank you so much, Rory, for that was a really, really great conversation and really great to see how energy fits into the whole scale. And again, what I really enjoy is, is an example, a tangible example where everybody can understand exactly what you do and how it relates to something specific. We know that there are very, very many different types of application areas, but to be able to see how engineering and computer science relates to one particular space, I think it's, I find it very, very effective. So Rory, thank you so much for that. So finally, we, have, we are finishing where we belong, back to my colleague, Dr. Indiana Colbert. Indiana is a lecturer in civil engineering, but she's also program director for project and construction management. So Indy, I'm going to hand it over to you, if you don't mind, and ask you to say your few words in this particular space. Yeah, absolutely. Delighted to share my presentation with you. Just talk. Can you see my presentation now? Not yet, Indy, you're coming on board. I can see it there. But you might like to put your microphone a little bit closer to you. Yeah. Can Perfect. you see my presentation now? I can see now. Everything is OK. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> Perfect. So um, welcome to my mock lecture on civil engineering and project and construction management. So as Catherine said, uh, my name is Dr. Ingrid. I am a civil engineer. I'm a lecturer in civil engineering at NUIT. I'm also project manager and I'm a program director for project and construction. So when I was preparing for this lecture, 
can't tell me what kind of subjects I, sh I should focus on. There are so many interesting areas and civil engineering. And then I thought civil engineering is the most diverse discipline of engineering. And we have so much different types of works that we do. So it would be very unfair to focus on a very small part of civil engineering where there is so much to show. As a result of it, I'm going to talk to you about civil engineering in general and give you an overview of various civil engineering disciplines. So we have a very long tradition of civil engineering here at any library. And if you look to the right, over 170 years, we have produced many graduates and some of them will be very, very famous. So on the right here, we have Alice Perry. And Alice, Alice Perry was the first engineer graduate in Ireland and also in Europe. And she was a civil engineering graduate here from NUI Galway. Isn't it fabulous? Here, NUI Galway has first female engineer, female civil engineer in Europe. This gentleman in the middle is Michael O'Shaughnessy, and Michael is our graduate. Then he moved to San Francisco. Eventually, he became a city engineer for San Francisco, and he developed a huge complex water supply system for San Francisco. And finally, here on the left, you can see a picture of Dr. Anya Brazil. She is again our own graduate. And now she's vice chair of Toronto Tomasetti, one of the leading civil engineering companies in New York. And she would be pretty much responsible for the skyline of New York. Isn't it impressive? Sure it is. So this old quadrangle building was home for civil engineering for years. But now we do have a world-class engineering building and it's a home for 1,100 undergraduate students and over 250 postgraduate students. And we have here, here a state-of-the-art laboratories and teaching facilities. Talk you through civil engineering. So I'm just going to give you an overview of what actually civil engineering is. So civil engineering is a professional engineering discipline that deals with the design, construction, and maintenance of natural and built environment. And over, over years, when I meet young people, students in various outreach activities, they always ask me what actually civil engineering is. Is it about building houses? And I say, sure, it is. House building is only a very small part of civil engineering. So I'm just trying here to dispel the myth that what civil engineers is doing is building houses. Much more than that. And I'll try to show you today. So civil engineers doing a lot of design and a lot of construction. So quite common applications would be bridges, would be houses, very complex houses, structures, skyscrapers, stadiums, but we also built tunnels. We are responsible for management of water resources. And more recently, we were focused on renewable energy, how to assess and how to harness energy. But we don't also build, we also do reconstruction of existing buildings too. Right, and pretty much Civil engineering work can be divided into six branches. So here we have geotechnical engineering, we have structural engineering, we have hydraulics and hydrology, we have environmental engineering, we have roads and transportation engineering, and also more recent, we have construction and project management. So I'm just going to give you a very quick overview of each of those branches. So geotechnical engineering is concerned with the engineering behavior of 
earth material. So we're looking at and using soil mechanics and rock mechanics to design underground works or just grant works like foundations, like embankments. We also do the analysis of slope stabilities and do some work for excavation purposes. So giving you example, Irish um, construction sector, I would like you focus on Carib gas tunnel. So this is an exciting project that costs um, 130 million euro for Shell Island. And in this project, a quite complex undersea tunnel was built, as you can see here on this map. That's a 4.9 kilometer tunnel that brings gas pipelines. And these pipelines bring gas from the offshore uh, gas platform close to the Aries head back on land. And that's all in County Mayo. So this project has finished and it's been successfully operated since 2015. And still this 4.9 kilometer tunnel is the longest tunnel in Ireland. So quite exciting and useful project. Let me just talk to you a little bit about structural engineering. So structural engineering is concerned with a design of a structure that would be stable and that would be able to resist all forces that act on the structure. And the most common applications would be bridges, would be stadiums, would be skyscrapers, or quite actually complex and sophisticated buildings. So, spot the difference. That's a work for you now. I'm showing you how civil engineering and civil engineering work has developed over the years. So, along with the kind of in association with um, material development, new technologies in construction, we are much able in better position now to build very complex structures. And if you look at what happened over the last 30 years in Shanghai, look at the upper image of Shanghai in 1990 and what it is now in 2020, you will see an amazing difference. And that's what structure news engineer do. And Shanghai now is home of one of the tallest buildings in the world. It wasn't the case in 1919. So talking about tall buildings, this is always something that excites us, civil engineers. So at the moment, the highest, the tallest building in operation is Burj Khalifa in uh, Dubai. That's 850 meter tall building, but there is a competitor on the way, which is the Kingdom Tower in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, that it's still under construction. There were some delays related due to COVID, as many things. Um, but once it's built, it will be the tallest building. It will be 1,008 meter high. Quite amazing. Everyone is looking forward to see this um, being completed and in operation. So the landscape and skyline of Dublin, it's not that dramatic at all. There is no need for it, but we do have few structures recently built that are very, very impressive. So one of them would be Aviva Stadium that I'm sure you're all aware of. It's actually beautiful, well working uh, structure. But the other one that I really want to show you is this absolutely beautiful Samuel Beckett bridge that kind of resembles a shape of harp and it just sits so nicely over the, the river, uh, Leafy River in Dublin. But structural engineering, it's not only about building and designing new things, it's also about reconstructing the existing one. And here is the example of St. Mel's Cathedral that unfortunately it got burned and there was a huge fire on Christmas Eve of 2009. But thanks to civil engineers, this beautiful cathedral 
was fully re reconstructed. And again, it looks magnificent. So, many of you have realized that civil engineering is also about supplying clean water to people and providing wastewater services. So, you probably all know that our statutory right as citizen is to have access to clean water. And this clean water is supplied and provided to us by environmental engineers. We also have hydraulic engineers. So this would be type of engineers that are dealing with management in general of water resources. So they would be responsible for, for flood protection. They would be responsible for building new um, hydraulic structures like dams or like weirs. But also more recently, hydraulic engineers are focused on assessing and harnessing energy from waves, from tides, from wind. So that's what engineers, civil engineers do. Right, just a very small example from Shannon Supply Scheme. Um, it's been currently, this project is currently on the way. Its estimated cost is staggering 500 million, and it's expect to bring water from River Shannon to the Greater Dublin area at staggering amount of 350 million liters of water per day. So the project is currently ongoing. It was take seven years to complete, but after that, this whole scheme will be operated for 70 years. So this is absolutely large size project for the scale of Ireland. Right. The civil engineering is also about transportation engineering and our transportation engineers are involved in the design and construction of roads, of motorways, but also we would be responsible for operation and management of traffic. We also might design and construct public transport system and also we might also build runways. So this was a transportation engineering and I think the best example for today to discuss this uh, branch of engineering is N6 Galway City Bypass. So some of you who are from Galway know how bad traffic can be, how congested it can be. And there is a great need for a bypass that will bring people from east to west of the city and from west to east. I'm one of those. So at the moment, um, transportation engineers are working to finalize the, um, the plan, the draft of the best route for this um, N6 Galway city. And Port Planola is just revising those plans. So we don't really know yet if the new bypass will go ahead or not. We just do hope that it will. So we'll see how it goes. So this was just an overview of all types of engin civil engineering <clears throat> that we all um, deal with. So just to give you an overview of the program that we offer. So under the civil engin engineering umbrella, we um, offer two streams. So four year bachelor of engineering and five year master of engineering. <clears throat> And the good thing about it is that you don't really need to decide whether stream, which of the stream you would like to go for. You can decide it at the um, beginning of year three. So if you want to hear more about civil engineering, what our own graduates think of civil engineering, what did they like, what they didn't like, what well, it's mostly about what they liked, you can just uh, Go to those videos and listen to them. Here you have a testimonials of Alison and Christian when they talk about civil engineering and their experience with placement. Um, that's pretty much all what I had on civil engineering. But let me just go through very briefly construction management. Um, as I told you, I'm a project manager. 
I'm certified project manager and I'm a program director for project and construction management. So what is actually project and construction management? So here with engineering and civil engineering, we offer a program, Bachelor of Science in program project and construction management. So this is very interdisciplinary program that trains students to carry out management roles in relation to construction project. So this is the discipline that deals with planning, organizing and managing the project. So it is delivered on time to the scope, quality and within the budget. So project and construction management required set of very mixed skills, such as technical, purely engineering skills, but also organizational skills, management skills, financial skills, business skills. And I suppose the most importantly, interpersonal skills, how we communicate things with people, how we deal with people. So these are all those things that uh, we're trying to teach our students. Right, so graduates from project construction management work mostly in construction sector. They mostly work with architect to make sure that the project is delivered on time and within the budget. But actually many of our graduates also find employment in telecommunication and in software development or in construction of offshore construction. But what I'm trying to tell you here is that the selling point of this degree is that it provides such a broad range of knowledge, the skills and skills that this goes much beyond civil engineering. So these are all transferable skills that you can apply in other sectors if you wish. You can go to finance, you can go to biomedical sector too. So currently it's estimated that 51 million people worldwide, worldwide is somehow engaged in project management. And out of this 51 million people, there are 16.5 million people that are certified project managers. And it is estimated that by 2027, 88 million people will be engaged in project management. And in fact, we are already in crisis and in shortage of construction engineers and project managers. And the Engineers Ireland CEO, Caroline Spillan is just asking us to produce more graduates. We just need to produce more construction engineers, more project managers, because that's what the industry needs. So definitely you are a good place if you're thinking about perhaps project and construction management. So just to summarize on this particular program, so PCM, it's a very interdisciplinary program that trains students to carry out all this management type of works. It would include some civil engineering modules, but also around 50% of all modules would be from area of quality, low economics, human resources, health and safety, and so on. And something very attractive for our own student is that we have a very interesting um, placement program, professional experience programs, and that's actually for both civil engineers and project and construction management, where we send our students for five months to work in industry. It could be in Ireland, it could be outside. In fact, many of our students would go to US or Australia or the um, UK to work on some exciting weird world um, projects. So with regards to teaching, um, we have very diverse activities and not really only those uh, lectures in lecture halls. We do a lot of projects where we use state-of-the-art facilities, which we have here in this fabulous um, new engineering building. 
So some of the projects could be done on the individual level. Some of the projects are done by group. So um, some of the projects will be about research. Some of the projects would be in collaboration with industry. So there is a lot of diverse activities that all our students are exposed to. And just to give rise and a few important points here is that what we offer here to you in civil engineering and in project construction management is a very challenging and very rewarding career. So you can decide if you want to be one of those sending that sit in office or you could be one of those that prefer to be and work on a site. You can be highly specialized, but also you can have a general knowledge. And this is also a profession like probably all of the engineering professions now that are continuously responding to changing worlds. And this is all now in the area of sustainability, sustainable practices. And this is when we look at the sustainable water use, energy in buildings, waste to energy. So, and we use very complex software such as building information modeling. So what I'm just trying to tell you to consider civil engineering and project construction management for a number of reasons. And one of them would be that we have excellent, excellent employment prospects. So that's pretty much brings to an end. If you have any queries, if you want to ask anything, just feel free to send me email. You have it here in diana.albert at nuygoway.ie and I'll be absolutely thrilled and delighted to, any, to answer any question you might have for us. Indy, thank you very much for that presentation. And it was a lovely way to finish up your, your conversation today by identifying the skills that are involved and, and also as well to the diversity and the range of, of, of what's happening in the space of civil engineering and project and construction management. Um, I would like just to finish up by thanking everybody and, and thanking you for, for attending today to everybody who is there. And I suppose just a few words without to rehash everything that we've done, but just to get a better understanding of, of how do we sum up engineering and computer science. Well, I suppose one of the first steps in the process is to, to be able to identify what problems are there, what problems we have, and then to try to invent some solutions for those, those problems as well too. Engineering as well is often about improving. We're trying to make our solutions faster, cheaper, smarter, better, safer, cleaner than other solutions that have gone before us as well too. Um, and also as well too, it's about applying those, implementing and deploying them in an industrial setting. And that's very, very important to us. So, so thank you very much for coming to join us today. If you're looking for a little bit more information, I'm about to, to show you there are some pro prospectus that are available online. If you look at engineer, nuigalway.ie, you'll come across our undergraduate prospectus. You'll be able to find some of the quick guides to courses. Um, and, and of course, some of the various different course web pages as well, too, will give you a much better informative, in, you know, understanding of, of what we do, who we are. And indeed, of course, if you have any specific questions that you'd like to ask, please don't hesitate to contact us because that is very, very important to us. Um, what I would like to turn around and just say is, is thank you so much for attending today, that we very much appreciate the time that you have given us. To, to listen to us speak about engineering. I think as you can understand, we love it. I hope you will love it as much as we do. Um, so if you are interested in joining us over the next coming years, please come and visit us. Come and email us, talk to us. When our conversation or when our buildings are open, come and have personal conversations with us. Come to our campus if you're nearby. We, we would love to see you. Um, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. So as I said, I'd like to thank you so much for your time today, but also I'd like to spend a particular time to thank your parents, who I know some of you have joined today, and also as well to thank so much to your guidance teachers and counsellors and, and everyone else who's supporting you in your educational space. I think it's really great that they're affording this opportunity to you 
that you can get an understanding of, of what's out there. Um, I'd like to finish up by thanking my colleagues today. We have so many people who rocked up um, to deliver a professional presentation online, even though this is not what we normally do. We are, make much better connections personally in the flesh where you can get to see our designs, you get to see our inventions, you get to see some of our solutions, and even you get to see us. We can't do that today, so therefore we have to pivot onto this online um, platform as well too. And of course we were given such wonderful help by so many people, so I'd like to say thank you very much for that. I think today was rather successful. I hope you found it successful. And I'd just like to finalize by saying we look forward to seeing you, hopefully in some capacity, if not an undergraduate, which we would expect, well, maybe you might come back and join us at a post from a postgraduate program later on. We, we very much appreciate your interest and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye.